And we're live. We're on air with a new person, Alicia. So, Hi. Alicia, what? Oh, sorry, I, I talked over you there. So, um, with, what are your like sort of like types in uh, Jungian sense and in Enneagram? And then I would fit a seven wing A, S S O, um, E N F P, I E E. All right. So what we're going to do, folks, we're going to go through the Galenko, um holistic profile of uh, IEE, the NFP, or any effects, as I uh, like to call it. And I won't click on the right thing. Although you might like to see her all the while, I'm going to click on my box. So uh, everyone can now see the, uh, the profile that we're going to go through. And so uh, if you look it up, folks, it definitely is a thing. If you look up on uh, Google about what a hot mess is, then that's how I describe uh, ENFP. And somebody described my uh, notes as a hot mess. And uh, I thought, OK, uh, for the moment, I'll take that as a But then I looked up the meaning and I thought, yeah, OK, I'm taking that. I like that. Phrase. So here we go. So this is the hot mess type. And so this is, as you can see here, we've got general description detailed description and that's all we're going to do today but it's a lot and we're going to like look at a little bit of and when i see and i've made some notes in this where where there's a little bit in here that's the same as what victor's got written in the uh the, the model g profile we're not going to con concentrate a whole lot on model g but it's just those little bits which are commonalities mm -hmm. and so this will make it easier for people to understand and so Alicia, what was your initial reaction when you read through this profile? Oh, gosh, it was funny. It's so funny because it's so fitting, which is where I was saying I wanted to hear Morgan Freeman, you know, narrating. You feel like an animal. Like, it's so predictable on some of these things that you just can't not see yourself. Like, the, um, just, you know, mo um, the motives of other people. Um, seek to manage feelings of others. I highlighted some things which you don't realize you're even doing. Um, Often unable to make himself do what is objectively needed. That's a little, <laughs> little sometimes. Um, yeah, uh, poorly combines what he wishes for with the concurrent reality of the situation. So over time, okay. we get better with some of these things, but they are kind of funny. Becomes easily tired of routine. Um, doesn't take well to strict discipline. I mean, these things are pretty funny. Right. So there you go, Faye. That's a little preview of the things that we're. Uh going to go through so right on screen now we have the first part the overview of the uh the nfp so oh yeah so i've got a bit there well you know when it says there um uh oh, oh, before i ask about that I'll, let's go with the first one about that what, what do you think about that bit there keenly discerns the motives of other people yes absolutely they're very worried about it apparently i, I mean it just <laughs> happens naturally um and, it, and I, it took me a long time to realize not everybody's doing that. But oh, I think no. it also keeps us. It's part of the Enneagram stuff, I think, too. Ah, yes, because that's going to make you more uh, a, a, atypical of your type. That's maybe a super ENFP in terms mm -hmm. of reading people because you've, you've got this framework. You've got these frameworks there as well to help in it. Have there been any times where you've been wrong about the discerning the motives of other people um i think the hard part is that it depends on what you're coming from where you're coming from you know if someone's doing something to be hurtful um but i don't think most people are i think most people right. are just unaware of how their impact is on other people so i i usually am not wrong and i will my SJ friends have believe in the intuition based on seeing the actual things come true. So I was proud of myself for that. Um, but yeah, no, it's usually pretty accurate. Okay. Now th this, this second one interests me a great deal. What, what about this uh, second sentence here that says gravitates towards the capable and the extraordinary personalities? Any examples of such people? I think it's the second, it's the second, it's right at the top. It says, I'll oh, just uh, move it down a touch. Right there, gravitates. Oh, yeah, no, you mean immediately second sentence. That makes perfect sense. Like checking different paragraphs. 
yeah oh yeah i think that's just for our in our own interest um and it will describe in here that we've become bored by very mundane um, right. things and so when someone is a little different or in motivated by different things it's very exciting to hear about right then so uh what, what about the uh so you, you okay so you've not given any details about who you which people you find capable and extraordinary okay <laughs> oh sorry okay no you just tell me you want more from it um yeah i mean motive i gosh whether i'm motivated by them or not i guess okay i like when they combine like the threes like ENTJ, yep. something like that if they combine that with a nice ethical backing yeah like what they're doing and that they're, that they're higher value than just you know making money or something like that I really, really enjoy oh. that to hear about. Oh. Um, because to me, it's not just what you get out of something, you know, that there's some other purpose. So it's just pretty typical if you read on the, in any grammar talks about that, if there's um, some higher, higher meaning to what you're doing. Right. Spiritually, whatever. What about this bit where it says there, knows how to cheer someone up, how to instill hope? Yes. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. It, it's, um, um, which is probably why I became interested in NLP and these things too, is when, you know, someone's upset, you'll notice that you get certain, certain people will come to you and call you specifically for that reason. And I think it's, if you want to go off of the Enneagram, it's the fear of, um, emotional pain. It's, it applies to other people too. Right. So if someone has a problem you want to solve, help solve it. Do you, do you find that you get a lot of that when it says here uh, do, advises on ways out of difficult life situations do you get a lot of that i think you touched on that a little bit before you get mm -hmm. people coming to you yeah oh yeah absolutely i mean it's um i mean it's not something that you really notice until you learn more about it but yeah i pretty much know where an exit is all the time in any situation you know and that way you're choosing to be there because you want to be not because you have to be right so uh we got this next one here altruistic for people towards whom he is sympathetic can do more than what was expected of him what the bit that got me was it's almost as if i mean you could almost phrase it as well what about those people that are not sympathetic to <laughs> that's what made me think about it well, you're going to, the lights go off pretty quick on that. And and that yeah. would be, well, what's their motive? You know, mm, if they're, right. if they're not somebody who's being very thoughtful to other people around and, and we're like, Hey, we're all here and we're trying, you know, and that person's not, and they're not aware that would be a little different. But, um, yeah, I think, it, I think that's what we're watching for is to make sure that we're all, uh, doing a little higher purpose. Do you, do you think the FJs or... Now we're in Socionics land, the FE ego types will, um, do you think they're more likely to have, uh, fewer, um, sort of check boxes and things for people to pass, uh, to qualify or, or, or is it a case? say with all would you say it's a case with everybody where we'll we say with a lot of the ns where oh they're sympathetic towards most people unless they do something that then is a red flag or something or do you um, have to connect first i think people are pretty oblivious across both to be honest in my opinion i don't think people are really discerning that much on and I, I almost think that comes back down to extroverted feeling too on how you're showing up and whether it's someone that they uh, share values with or whether they're just you can cross oh gosh these functions cross over to me because if you were going to take si and you're going to yep. say with fe you know and how they do it and yep. um trying to think how to form that that thought um I think that I think that my way of NFing, I think that I usually stay pretty true to what I believe in. 
Yeah. I don't waste too much time. I'm pretty good about it. And that's covered in here too, which is so funny because I waste time all the time. But how I spend my time, I don't regret typically where sometimes they will a little bit more. So I actually don't think that they do that better. Do you usually, when, when you do waste your time, is it having fun? And then the yeah. part of it is that it was like, well, it wasn't that much uh, waste. It wasn't productive, but it was fun. And that kind of. Yes, yes. So it's like funny. It's like you can be such a time Nazi and then like totally fart around doing things and silly things. But it's it's because it's like it brings me happiness. It brings me joy. And just to get to live in the moment and really letting your, you know, the extroverted intuition just be free to feel free and not like you have this mundane checklist life. Right. So when I'm wasting time doing something that's not helpful for someone else and it's boring is double negative. I think what I would, I think I'll sort of rephrase things by if I sort of state what the stereotype is in terms of the way they frame functions in uh, on the channels where people are just starting to talk about uh, the functions and how they, they think about FE and FI. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the cliche would be that the FE ego types, so the FJs and MBTI and Kersey folks, would be generally they're, they're more sympathetic to people um, unless that person has done something wrong. And then they might say, oh, for the FI, that there needs to be a... I'm not saying this is what I believe. I'm just saying how people would mm -hmm. say it. Some people might say it on YouTube. And that for the FI people, there has to be a connection there. Because there's always that cliche there that FI is selfish and the FE is more altruistic. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you think that... Now, Jeff would say it's an instinct for him. To be generous and so it could be and as you know because you know enneagram there's lots of different motivations for this kind of thing like people can be so-called altruistic but it's like they can get an esteem boost from it oh look how good i am for helping all people so it's Absolutely. like it's not super duper egoless so it's not at all that's why when you're and maybe where i'm I'm at this stage of learning so much about it and year and a half in that they're all getting something out of it. It's just yeah. what? And half the time they don't know. So I don't think that um, our type is, I don't think if I is, is more selfish. I, yeah. I, I mean, it can be unhealthy. If it's unhealthy, I think it would be. Yeah. Because I think it's super self-focused if it's unhealthy. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of those things, as you said there, it's self-focused and it depends on well then it's like it's not so much about the process it's about what is the nature of that self is that a mm -hmm. self that is, is naturally selfish i mean someone can be very self-referential but if that but if that is like in quote unquote good person then it doesn't matter it just means they have their own standard that they're going by and and then it's a case of well is their own internal measure good if the person's of good character it doesn't matter that they're self-centered because the thing that they're referring to is good yeah yeah absolutely because they're all kind of driving from something that's giving them something back yeah. whether it's order or or love and affection and, and and compliments or you know achievements or attention all of it is is pretty you, know. and, and you could <laughs> And you could have somewhere where, say, we got a little bit off the subject here, folks, but the, this is the tricky thing with FE and FI, because there's a lot of overlap and people use both. And both concepts of FE and FI are heavy reductions of the whole area of, because it's like trying to cover the whole, it's like trying to just use two concepts to cover the whole area of people being nice to each other and interpersonal connections. And then there was people who write all these relationship books and must just think, you think you can cover it all with two little definitions? So yeah, but it's but it is big. It yeah. the way it translates into situations. It's so it's really interesting that they will kind of pull one topic. So what I try to what I'm trying to explain, uh, or, or really to 
think about myself and then talk about it is what are these things just and it's one of the things that you learn from enneagram is where you think about it healthy average unhealthy so what would what would this look like so in a healthy sj especially sfj they pretty much are helping people just they're not doing it as a self referential thing about all oh, this is part of my they're just like doing it it's like level one in enneagram two where it's just an instinct and they're being actively kind mm -hmm. whereas you might be other less healthy sjs who perform the same action but they see it as out of a sense of duty so it's not really then coming from themselves or less from the, the only thing that's coming from themselves is the sense of duty mm -hmm. but it's like then do they really want to do it or are they doing it out of a sense of duty and i think but i think the healthier say a healthy esfj I don't think they're going to be doing it out of a sense of duty. They're just doing it because they just think it's the right thing to do. And they might not even think about it, just do it. But in terms so. of a six or a two, they have their payoff is, is belonging. Yeah. And, you know, the, um, needing the being needed part, you know, and, and for six is it's huge on belonging and fitting in the group. So, I mean, that's still, Sorry, just yeah. it's still to me it's the same thing. Um, yeah. So it's funny. Like now I'm thinking. I mean, I if someone asks me for help, if I'm somewhere and they're upset or someone starts to talk to me, no matter who they are, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing and I will talk to them and do yeah. that in the moment stuff. And um, I love talking to strangers. I do that all the time. People talk to me. Um, and that I think is is like if someone's upset or you're helping someone like I was at the airport and their wheels were locked up and the guy was pushing on the um you know little people mover thing yeah like, you, know, you just stop and you just help because it's just the right thing to do but and um, does that make you feel better no I wanted to go to Starbucks I just oh, all right. all okay. <laughs> so, I was so, running out of time so conflicting emotions there different parts of of people so it's like so sometimes so sometimes can you feel oh uh, oh i love helping people but then other times it can like uh, it's almost say yes it's the right thing and it's a good thing but then is it also sometimes of oh, oh well i don't i want to avoid the guilt of not doing it um i think well I think I like helping people, so I don't think it. I don't think it makes me feel good or bad. I mean, if I didn't do it and someone needed help, I would. I guess I would make me feel bad, but I don't do that. So you know, I don't know that I get a payoff. Like so on the on the seven, which are the social seven, I kind of fit pretty yeah. close. Um, but they call it the martyr, you know, and you're just kind of yeah. doing it because that's just the right thing to do. In your mind, you know, but it's not. For the other reasons that the SJs might get. Yeah, I'm just going to show you something that uh, we're going a little bit off topic, but this is where temperament can come in, and this is something that Jeff talked about, and he talked about guilt guts, uh, and he says that he's never experienced guilt guts, and he says that he thinks that the SPs genuinely don't, they usually don't experience guilt gut, and that to them he thinks that it's an instinct, so if they feel it, they're going to do the kind thing. But if they don't do it, they're not going to be not going to beat themselves up about it or feel as guilty. Whereas he thinks the SJs might feel that guilt thing, or maybe the NFs would, because it's it's so situational to SPs that they don't know when they're going to have that feeling. Oh, really? Of, yeah, of like when to because because them their ethics is so situational. As, as, it's going to be more so with the SFP. I'll see. I'll I'll show you what I mean with because uh, I wrote up what Jess said about it, uh, okay. and it's going to be in. Okay, that's the Jungian folder, and then um, it's going to be on. I think it's going to be on functions. It's going to be. Uh, I should. Jeff Miller's. Jeff on the. Uh, I think FE can be exploited easier, ah. which is maybe what you're talking about. And I just thought of that because I've seen it. 
And I remember thinking, like, don't you know when you feel bad? Which is probably my FI talking, you know, that I watch that. And it's like, actually, I think I just actually figured that out this week after watching people do that with. I see what, Alicia, you, you could uh, help me out a little bit here. There's, there's a bit there where it says in the, uh, these next couple of sentences, like light and kind in communication and uh, warmth, and then this next bit of this second paragraph. If you, if you comment on those things while I look for that, uh, okay. that thing from Jeff, that would be uh, great. Okay, with his sincerity and warmth inspires trust. Yes, I know that that is definitely true because it is sincere. It's not. Uh, may become offended if he doesn't obtain an emotional response. Hmm, I don't know about that. Um, seeks to manage the feelings of others. I think, yes, if there's a situation where someone is upset, you want to see that get worked out before the end. Like, that's the goal. Um, mobilizes and becomes active in extreme situations. And I would think that that is someone needing help and you just do it automatically without having to question yourself. Yeah. I was thinking that that maybe is like a general trait of the EPs because they're either going to be SE DOM mm -hmm. or SE role function. And the overall mindset is flexible, active. And so they're going to, they're going to switch between it. And I still think that if you, Set up if Dario set an EEG up on uh, ENFPs and ENTPs throughout most of the day. I still think they're going to be doing the SE thing more than the NE thing because just what? of the nature of extra the way sensing is that it's like very hard to like block out sensing. I think it's it's our material, so it's what we're using to do the NE thing. So like I don't notice oh. cars around me too much. Like I'm going to catch something and then I run with it. So while I'm running with the other ideas, the rest of the environment is kind of missed. But it's present. So <laughs> it's present, yet it's not. You know how that, you know, you're, you're, you're taking the things outside of you and you're going with it. Like my ideas are coming from what I see. Right. Oh, yeah. And so uh, we were talking before we did this hangout about uh, only being able to do one thing uh, <laughs> at a time. So we've got the um, one thing. Well, well about this about extreme situations. Okay. Just, yeah. Yeah. So in ex okay, I don't do well blood, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I mean I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to make sure I can help someone, and that's just because I think that's just what you do. Um, and, and I'm pretty, I can, I can be present in that way, provided I don't get stuck in my head too much, um, provides resistance to and repels unjustified, unjustified attacks. That's true. I will speak my opinion if I need to, but it's cooperative. Like you, we were talking about the other day, it's cooperative and, until it's not, you know, until something happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this part's funny. He is often unable to make himself do what is objectively needed. It, it, it's a little pulling teeth, but that's just because we want to feel inspired. And it's not super inspiring to open your mail. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, poorly combines what he wishes for with the concurrent reality of the situation. Uh, I think that's idealist, maybe. Also, maybe... Enneagram seven, because a lot of that's because a lot of when somebody's writing a profile of the ENFP, then a lot of those ENFPs are also going to be Enneagram type seven, and so some of those things of like all of these future plans or the the idealism, because uh, yeah. I do it as well. And it's like you have the plan, and it's almost like. Well, now you've got to do it. You've got to move towards the planet. It's not just enough to plan it. You have to actually move towards it. But then, I yeah. don't know if you're the same, like, that we then have plans for a lot of different things, and then we spread ourselves too thin. That's real typical for sevens, but then it's also going to come from, I think, life experience and your instincts. Because um, I was around sevens my whole life who would not complete. They would talk about it. And from the Tom Condon class, 
he was saying that that's very typical and actually talking about it makes your brain think you've done it yes. and that you won't yeah. do it after. So I think I haven't been too bad about that. And I always have tried, you know, the grass is greener if you're missing out thing, you just have to check yourself, you know, so you don't let it run away. I'm going to give this one more chance to see if it's in here. And if it's not, it's just going to be, okay, it's gone. I'm going to try and say what, what Jeff said. Uh, he said he was watching s something maybe on a kid's show, and he was talking about these kids that they had this thing called guilt guts, where it just oh. like felt really guilty. And he said that he's, he never had that. Of And he, I think he said the closest thing that came to it for him was when he was with his friend and uh, with some uh, uh, teenage girls there. And there's, I think he said, like, he just, like, maybe tugged or did something to the coat of his friend. But he did it because it entertained the girls he was with. But then he annoyed his friend. And he, and he felt bad afterwards about doing that for his friend. But that was about the worst he could come up with. So I don't know if he's just doing that to, like, virtue signal. But Jeff isn't a virtue signaler. So it's, like, so it's like, oh, is that the worst thing you can come up with to be guilty about? So it's not. I thought, yeah, no, I mean, it's, that is funny. I mean, I guess maybe it would be what comes to your mind. I felt really bad the other day about something. Um, I was getting ready to leave Cincinnati. I went over to go buy souvenirs and realized I didn't grab my wallet when I was there. And I was like, pickles, you know, so I leave there and I'm trying to walk back and like, Four different beggars were on the street trying to hit you up money. I literally had no money. I couldn't even get those things I was trying to get. And then this guy, as I'm just about to walk to the hotel, has this CD thing and he's kind of shut, pushes it at me and says something about his CD or, you know, he made. And I said, I don't have any money because I just had people hit me up the whole way. And he said, I didn't ask you for any money. And he turned and walked away. And I felt so bad because. I didn't, you know, it was just one after another. Yeah. I didn't get a fine. I did say, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but he already had walked away and it was already done deal. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche phrase, but there's true to it. That phrase, compassion fatigue, where at a certain point, people can, uh, they, it, they get like, they get almost normalized to it too much. And I can give you an example of this where in India there's a huge number of uh, poor people and they have uh, cricketers there who become very wealthy and it was when uh, and it's almost like it becomes normalized to them so it's like they almost can like it's almost like when something becomes a huge big problem it's like they don't want to think about it and it just becomes that thing that's accepted yeah yeah i can see that and i and a, an Aust and a cricketer from australia steve war he he would help with um with these people in uh india that had leprosy and as you know leprosy is contagious mm. uh and so he went and it was almost like some of the uh, indian cricketers said that they almost felt shamed by uh steve war because um he was doing something that they should do uh so there is that thing like if if you're surrounded by it so much it's like well what can you do whereas as you said there i mean some problems are just so big that people can't because because i also they might think well if i had to help that person i'd have to help everyone <laughs> i couldn't help anyone at that point i literally yeah. didn't have anything with me but it was funny it was such a good example and it's kind of like the stuff we're talking about where how much we let things hurt our feelings or upset us is an is a example of us not the other person you know because i didn't mean that towards him he's putting he's offering me something i wasn't going to assume he was going to give it to me it wasn't him saying here please take right. this for you know so i know i hurt his feelings and i felt terrible because i didn't intend to Right. But uh, at the same time, I kind of think that's why I try to let things roll off, which might be the seven-ish thing. But to assume that that person's trying to hurt your feelings or be offensive is not always right either. So, you know, yeah. it's my, my own coping way is not to let it upset me. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense, though. And, it, and the fact that it stayed with you, 
uh, well, it's something to learn from, but it's an understandable uh, situation. Uh, oh, there's a bit there about the uh, the TE. Uh, he is often unable to make himself do what is objectively needed. Uh, I don't, you may have talked about this already. Uh, I'm not sure. Poorly combines what he wishes for with the concurrent reality of the situation. I think you've had, for, but demonstrates initiative. First demonstrates initiative, but then seeks people who ensure implementation of his ideas without his participation. I think you talked about some of that, but I don't know if you talked about the last bit about almost deputizing people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that it seems very self pressed to me in the way that that comes out. I mean, at least from what I've seen, um, I think that part of the focus with the NE and with the, you know, desire to be entertained a little bit, we do have to all, you know, you always have to rein in what you need to do with what you want to do. Um, that's a choice that we have to make. Um, <laughs> the implementation of his ideas without his participation. That is a big thing though. I do say any ground six as you start businesses typically are not working in them, but I mean, I, I have been, <laughs> I work in my, I'm a one man show. Um, but that's also because I prefer to not have to teach and explain it. Right. Cause that takes time I, and energy to do that. I heard from the, uh, uh, the 1980s tribute Enneagram guy here at McNay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You gave an example of. I hope, I hope you're listening in because we love we love your channel. Yeah, it's a absolutely. very good channel. And it, and and it was because of he his. I mean, he he promoted the book Enneagram Made Easy almost as much as I promote Dario Nardi's book Eight Keys to Self Leadership. And I got mm -hmm. that book because of him. So uh, thanks to him for that. But he also said he was in he was involved in business, and he said that it was good for him because it enabled him to see all the things that could go wrong. Oh. And therefore, carefully plan. Was he a six? Yeah, but I do. But I can oh see God, though. Yeah. But a, so the six can do that. But I would imagine though. But we, if they ever get any like difficulties, they might feel it worse than other people. Oh, and yeah. then the stress level. Yeah. Involved. Well, I think the worst case scenario things are real for them. Um, I work with at least one today i almost wondered if they were both um and it's so funny and cute because you'll hear the references people make constantly you know what they're doing where they're you know making sure this is okay or that's okay and it's safety stuff and it's just very type related and so i think with my this keeps me entertained throughout my day with what i have to do compared to what i want to do you know the part of being an adult you know working it out is that I use these things to entertain myself and keep my any busy is thinking about other things while I'm doing what I need to do. So I've, I've gotten better about those things. So, uh, put here EP stuff. Uh, uh, now it, it's also, uh, artisan stuff in Kersey, but I didn't want to mix the systems too much for once. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it is generally, I mean, Vic, Victor definitely has say the SE DOMs. Mm. As artisani, and he and he has a lot of that for the a lot. There's a lot of overlap with the general mindset of the EPs with the SP. So this stuff here about what do you think about that final paragraph there of that section becomes easily tired of the routine. Yeah, that so, so a lot of this stuff. I think it comes. I mean, just like what we were talking about with human nature, how much of your life you can actually change from your boredom level or that you have to make it entertaining the best you could. So in my situation, I have not changed a bunch of things. Like I will take on hobbies, um, like these things that I like to learn about NLP and Enneagram and typology and all these things that I have nothing to do with my employment, but um, it just adds to my mental entertainment. So I think this is, but it is common. I know I hear it a lot with other people, but maybe they had the ability to rely on someone else to financially support them while they tinkered around. Right. You know? So this is one of these things that Jeff would talk about where he would say, uh, preference versus behavior. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think over time they say you kind of get stronger in those shadow functions. Yeah. Them. Uh, well, some of them, 
Uh, yeah, or you can, or they, or, or I think maybe people discover workarounds. Yeah, that would be really, really funny to find out. I bet you're right. Like, cheat yeah. the round the system to uh, take yeah, it just like, long enough. <laughs> I mean, TP might think that like, they're like, oh, I've got all these good business ideas. I, I need to hook up with somebody who can get stuff done. And just get like, an ISTJ. Yeah, 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 get, get an ISTJ. <laughs> get it done, get it implemented. Yes. Oh, they're amazing. Well, but that's what a good partnership is. Good friendships and good partnerships where you can and you bring your talents and they bring theirs. And uh, that's yep. very stubborn. You, you're, using, <laughs> you're using the FI with the T either. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. But, uh, but checking in to make sure you're not taking advantage of that, you know, and making sure it's working for everyone. Uh, so this bit about here, uh, what about the meticulous detailed work? Is that like a, a strain? Uh, so it, it uh, I always say it's like a failed perfectionist because there's a part of seven. That, seven goes to one. Mm. We, we take traits of one, which is, you know, doing it, being critical and in, in, in wanting it to be right. Um, and so when I put effort into something, I, I can do it perfect. And most people I work with think I'm very type A, actually, which is funny. For me, <laughs> you know? oh, for, me, for me, when I do it, I almost get annoyed. It's like, yes, I've made it better, but it's almost taken 10 times as much effort to make it 10% better. Because you're going into the detail so oh. hard, you know, that it's, yeah, I think, and so when you're doing that, like when I'm doing that, and the NE goes and takes off, it, you're just, it, it gets to be just a mess, because you will spend so much time to make it right. Right. Um, so so for me, I, I try not to get involved in things that require that necessarily, like, yeah, <laughs> I can do it, I just don't like it. What about that uh, final sentence there? Oh, absolutely. That IE has an excellent intuition for people. Like, that's, I love people. That's what. Uh, I oh, no, sorry, sorry, I meant that bit. He doesn't take well to strict discipline and respect oh, yeah, for formal yeah. subordination. You mean reading each line and not skipping through to another uh, other paragraph? <laughs> like that? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Th and that's very seven ish, too. Uh, we believe in all people are equal. You do you and I'll do me. You know, if it. Yep comes to an issue where people which but at the same time we are so people oriented i know i am that i want other people to be happy so i'm already trying to to be accommodating yeah but if being accommodating is killing my soul then it's a little bit you know yes yeah, so it's like <laughs> that mindset there the ep mindset is is deaf i think definitely you can see it amongst extroverts that mm -hmm. difference between ep and ej it just becomes tricky with the introverts when it's like the difference between IJ and IP because it's like, well, it depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at someone's internal inner state, that's one thing versus someone's behavior, which mm -hmm. is like a compensation for it. That's it's tricky with the introverts, JP. But with um, the extroverts, I th it's definitely a thing. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I love what Catherine Favre said on your hangout too, where she was talking about if you take an MBTI and you take the instinct stacking along with the Enneagram, I mean, it's everything. It explains everything about somebody and why they do what they do, because some of it looks a little different, uh, like a, a sexual dominant versus a self press you know, those look so different in them alone too. I mean, separate, I know I'm going off topic, but I know that's okay. That's fine. because It's all relevant because what we've been discussing is um, all the stuff about the motivation. Of, yeah. And, and you are seven ish. I'm, I'm seven ish. And, um, this has it, been and going. It, it, the seven is like EP extra EP. Yeah, big, for sure. Big, big overlap there. And um, it's funny cause I think of like, sometimes I feel like, Oh, totally ambivert. Like, in a weird way, like we don't just need to be everywhere. We like to be talking to people we find interesting or. Um. There's a weird thing of the way Kersey defines. It's just what you said there about ambiverts is that. Abstract types mm -hmm. can tend to be more in their heads than the concrete types. And of course, 
well, there's two kinds of being in your head. So it's like, are you in your head because you're doing something abstract or are you doing it because you're introverted? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, uh, it's a little bit tricky because everything that's abstract is inside your head. But so when you get an extroverted uh, intuitive, well, they are going to have modes where they're inside the head a lot because that's the nature of abstraction because mm -hmm. you sense things that are outside of you and the abstractions are inside of you. So they can, they can probably do things that look introverted. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's so funny too, because as, if you don't allow yourself to let it wander, you won't get to any of those patterns and the things that we do naturally and skillfully that not everybody does, you know, which I appreciate the different, all the different types, because I think they do all bring something, but we will look spaced out quite a bit of the time on our own. Mm. We're not bringing yeah. that in, you know, because you're like Ooh, all over the place. I, and putting and I think, together. <laughs> I think Jung would say is the way to tell the difference is the way their extroversion, uh, the way their intuition is extroverted or introverted is like, what is it stimulated by? If it's stimulated by something external, mm. and then you take on an like, abstraction and your world goes off somewhere, it's still stimulated from, it's it's still an external, extroverted, objective intuition. Um, and we went over yesterday when we looked at um, Douglas Adams. It was still an, an external impulse when he heard that thing about the judo, use your mm -hmm. opponent's way against himself. That's still external, and then he did something with it introverted intuition is supposed to come from within yourself your own psyche a perception from within mm -hmm. so say say uh, in the most extreme example something bubbling up from your unconscious Ooh, uh, and then <laughs> you get stimulated i know it's, it's weird that ni thing isn't it and yeah. so it's not really based on anything but their own like unconscious like weird dream or something and so it can wow. get super duper subjective yeah, that sounds more subjective than the other ones we've been discussing, yeah. actually. So, um, th this actually should be a, a hangout on its own about the difference between, say, who, who is more subjective and more objective, like an extroverted intuitive type, uh -huh. because they're extroverted, they're more objective, because Carl Jung would say the extroverts are objective, and the introverts subjective. But if you compared them with, say, an SI DOM, well, but the SI DOMs are sensing types. So are they more objective because they're sensing types or less objective because they're introverts? Oh, I don't think they're objective at all. I, yeah. I you know, this I'm excited to hear about with Catherine talking about the difference of combining the two because yeah. you go and you look at that agenda that everybody has their own and you combine that with their functions and what are they gaining? You know, it's yeah. or what are they coming or what are they going off of? Because in the SI, I mean, the ones that I know are so based on absolutely their only their experience. And if their experience has been limited, yeah, it's this big, you know? Although, in terms of behavior, and that's one of those things where you want to look at the kind of SJ that they are. Like, if they're the kind of, like, book smart SJ that will, like, because they do exist where they're just, like, <laughs> voracious. <laughs> Like look at the most popular titles say that would be a thing that people could look at if they look at the top non-fiction titles on amazon then you can judge for yourself folks how many of these are like sensing types sensitive oh yeah intuitive kind of books and i think a lot of them would be like it's like st stuff practical stuff and it's like and if, and if it sounds traditional i think whoa these sjs are really like in this thing because uh certainly with if you look at political books on amazon say the top 20 18 will be say uh libertarian or conservative leaner mm -hmm. books and see so i think those sjs like to read gosh so they must i know it would be kind of funny to find out what it is because i'm sure it's so select it's the introverted sensing it's it's especially if what they're reading sort of paints pictures with words Mm -hmm. They really get into that. That's my, from what I've spoken to my mother about, about her particular reading process, the way her introverted sensing works, where if a smell is mentioned, described, 
it doesn't even have to be described it's just as you mentioned and then she can instantly imagine the smell or and i asked her about and so she can imagine things on a on a concrete level so i even asked her can you imagine and we, we were talking about claire richards beforehand about what well, good kind of singer she is and say so could you imagine claire richards so she has the ability to like imagine claire richards say singing a song so great Thank that you. means you can imagine your favorite song sung by different people you know how they sing yeah which they're not doing that they're is not. like it's pretty good that's like the introverted sensing superpower where as long as the imagination is you've experienced it and it's so reality based that you can have this instant recall of what something because i have to concentrate hard to imagine a smell yeah that's, me too like I, I can't even see a reason to do it right so the reason i brought this up is she was reading through all the like the ebooks of say the game of thrones novels and they're yeah. notorious for having so much description in them and she loved all the description in them so i think uh the sjs especially if they're reading books about like just things in the past in the civil war and all the detail all the sensory detail they're gonna like and that's a thing with si the sensory mm -hmm. detail so how do we get onto this topic we've got it's two mps <laughs> we i can't so we've maintained our two viewers though although maybe they're different two viewers than what they were five minutes ago so we'll uh we'll get on to this oh yeah i think we were talking about something about introversion extroversion and yeah. uh because you mentioned ambiversion and then i i took the ball and then i ran with it off the field and into another field <gasps> um well it's true though i mean all of it shows up and it's true it was funny i read somewhere and i don't know who had said it but said si doms are seeking out experience and i'm like not the ones i know but i mean I was yeah it's me different <laughs> i've noticed that like enfp is an enormous type likely to want to travel yeah oh, yeah yeah now that's a real thing i mean it's so funny like uh richard Rohr talks about that in his is um, Enneagram seven and he's just saying we love to just even look at flight patterns which is actually like anything like anything that's somewhere else because it sounds fun and new and something different right um, yeah that, as I, you like, said that like, as you said there's something different and uh because if, if people see because Blake Silvertooth great name was on this channel on Friday and uh if you people go to her youtube channel you, you'll see that she like travels everywhere and i was just thinking about what they would get out from traveling what, what they would get out of the experience well you've got the ep thing of actually like being active but then there's like meeting different people and then the new experience thing so it's like with enfp and like traveling abroad it's like you've got the ep thing of being active you've got the anything of the curiosity and then you've got the nf thing of meeting different people and you're just enjoying yourself you know it's just so um present and in the moment and plus when you're going back through and you're doing the normal everyday things you need to take care of there's just so it's so boring it's mentally boring whereas when you're going somewhere different and you get to take yeah. in other things it's exciting and fun there's some, some cliches are, are cliches because they're true but they used to be uh an old one and, and enfps will definitely agree with this cliche i'm going to come up with now uh not not come up with repeat uh travel broadens the mind oh yeah yeah i i mean i think it does it makes me feel alive i mean i can do the same old thing in routine i've been doing it for a long time but uh, um but i won't do it the same way every day i don't do anything yeah. the same way and that's jeff he's like he always talks about wanting to freshen it up yeah it keeps uh -huh. it exciting <laughs> for whatever you're doing so we have here the detailed description that's it folks we've just been right in there we're going to get into the detailed description oh yeah and then i'll put here like um kersey sort of like really demystified <laughs> intuition by just saying it's induction but uh, i think this is a fair description of the process there on um what do you think about that uh those first couple of sentences there the one that starts with iee -E has Oh, excellent intuition for people. He definitely assesses motivation for others from is there phrases, intonation, facial expressions, and particular. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know why. I You know what? I think this goes back to the boredom with normal everyday stuff, which is probably why we're doing that so much, is to keep our any interested. 
is it when yeah. you know, you're just doing think, this normal thing and you're paying attention to well i wonder why the person does this or says this it's innocent yeah yeah one of these things is like it, it, it almost becomes like an ultimate given as to like someone will ask like an sj might ask resembler might ask well why are you interested in lots of different things because i am <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, but it's our way that we're doing this without. I mean, even if before and even without knowing anything about um, cognitive functions, we're still doing it naturally. Just we do it naturally. So while well, you have to be in this area for this much time, you're going to do things to make it more interesting. So I definitely could see how paying attention to, uh, like I've been able to type enneagram type yeah. people close to me and be totally right, which was cool and fun. No, I mean, I know they yeah. say don't do it, but most people aren't going to spend a year reading all this stuff to figure yeah. it out. So yeah, and and that's not it's just, that's not bragging, folks. That's just the natural preference of an experienced DNFP resembler. Plus, you know, if you're experienced with the Enneagram and Socionics and NLP and you've worked a lot with people, you pretty much should be good at that. <laughs> yeah, it's just for fun. It was just like, well, for fun, and it's interesting to see how relevant it is um but that you could pay that much attention to people to be able to do that you know it's kind of neat and and that not that you're trying to and it's not in any way of a judgment it's only just out of care and love because it's because people are interesting the differences and whatnot so yeah i think that part where it talking oh easily guesses what another person is striving for that's just because that's what we're doing we're observant in that one, way yeah there's that's one thing there on um because we were talking about before about um, NPs doing the rapport thing with FI. And what I've just noticed there is this isn't so that is an example of, of ENFP doing the FE thing. I mean, mm -hmm. the phrase is that's the phrase is objectively there, the intonation is objectively there, the facial expression is objectively there, the behavior is objectively there. And then it's okay where have i and then you'll know and again from a more range of experience of other people where these patterns have occurred before like what usually happens after that expression it all becomes a huge wealth not sort of articulate but it's like so you know the patterns occurring and those are patterns in fe things well ethics of emotions things those are things that are actually there and say an ESTP would notice those same things, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't make the connections the way yeah. ENFP. And when I asked Dario Nardi, and I can repeat this because he actually repeated it in the event that he did for the Matrix Insights Network. I asked him, um, is it true that ESTP is the most observant of the types? And he says, yes, ESTPs and ENFPs, the most observant of, uh, in terms of body language. Oh, funny. So I'm wondering, so maybe we could have a situation where they would uh, notice the same things, but ENFP might do more with it. But with that comes the other, is the phrase, is a double-edged sword, the other edge of the sword where they can make the connections and bang on target, but sometimes they might be misled and go somewhere else. But I suppose when they become really good at it, good at it and really experienced with a lot of people and more mature, then they're going to make good connections with it. And also yeah. they'll have the experience of being wrong in the past. <laughs> and so they'll know what sort of mistakes, what to know, or they might think, oh, this could mean this. Does yeah. it necessarily mean this? And because it could mean this, I'll then ask this follow-up question. So they'll know where to go to, to maybe confirm their suspicion that yeah. say a year before they might've been wrong about. Sure. And we don't really um, chalk people up and think good or bad the same way as I don't say the same way, but I know I don't. That was where you said, can you be wrong? And it can be kind of hard to measure it. What are you measuring it by? You know, because no, no one's like purely wrong or bad, um, yeah. but it might not be in line with my idea of what I like or, you know, that. So it's a little different sometimes. Um, I would be, um, it would be, say, if I was writing a scene where there was, say, an ENFP character and they were telling the other person what they thought the situation was, mm -hmm. and then what you would have is Robert McKee where the other person reveals the truth and, like, the gap opens. McKee calls it the gap between expectation and results, between 
the between the uh, the subjective realm of how you think the world is and the objective realm of how the world really is. So it gets quite philosophical, Robert McKee. And so it's like yeah. the person might have this character revelation. Oh no, no, that wasn't because of that. It was because say this thing happened to me when I was four or my dad. And it's like so this extra information comes out, and it was like whoa, I didn't know that. I was completely wrong. I, I wonder I if you've ever encountered a revelation, a new piece of information where it was like, whoa, well, if I'd have known that, I would have had a completely different judgment. You know, honestly, I'm like trying to go back. I mean, I, I, I haven't, I don't have a lot of regrets. And I, I normally stay with, and, and most of my experiences kind of firm up from my idea. Yeah. So I mean, for the most part, I think I'm not judging it as much as I'm paying attention to it. So that's the part that I think any can do right. an SE thing because we're not calling it good or bad. We're just right. seeing, oh, well, they, they might be this or this or this or for this reason, but that also can work kind of bad. So when they talk about function loops, they say yeah. uh, FISI, you can do this, this loop, which once I heard that in just a random thing, that actually was really powerful for me because if you get stuck and he can go right. where oh my gosh if this happens for this person it would right. be bad for their children or be bad for whatever and you could really oh. mentally go off into you know their futures and worrying for them also you know when it says we've got here with the um say the intonation say you've got uh two enfp twins uh they could look at the same person but if they've had different experiences they're going to connect, say, some of these things to those different experiences, and they will feel differently about it, even though they've got the same process, but because they're linking it to different things. And, and if they've got that pool of SI internal stuff and then some different kinds of memories in there of, say, say a bad relationship they had in the past, mm -hmm. and then they meet this other person. So, so, you, so you could imagine twins. One of them's had a bad relationship, they meet the same guy. And I have like different views on him because one might remind them of the the guy who was bad. So. Yeah, and that's when you need NLP to help you go right out of that. It's ah. powerful how they talk about those things. You know, you attach an emotion with something that's done, but I would imagine that across right, so, the board. So we, we've lost one of our audience members, but we've got the one at the moment. And so, so we would say this is the FE stuff. So this is the FE with the NE, like, so all of these things are objective, the phrases, the facial expressions, the peculiarities, but, but it's then interpreting it and making connections. Now, the other part of it is trying to explain FI. What I'll then say is, I'll just show people this bit about uh, rapport, and this is in an NLP book, and this is about connection. What And people can connect over different things, NFs are the most likely to connect over values. Mm -hmm. so. And, you know, I'd love to have a way to tell, test, like, what you're talking about, where it's, okay, well, when are we wrong? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a way to test that sort of a thing, except for life experience and knowing when have you been wrong. Unless, you know? yeah, unless someone corrects you and reveals something and where it's an absolute re revelation of, like, new information. I, I have had it said before to give smaller steps. So with any is you can go off into, like I said, you can go off into like very long-term worries, uh, concerns, thoughts. They're not what's happening right here and right now. You're thinking, well, because you know, this person does this, it means they're going to do that. And, and those things I think are relevant and true because patterns are what they are. Yeah. Um, but, but then by the time your mind is fully, conceived what you what you think of this you really couldn't explain it without like i wouldn't even want to talk about it too much it'd be tiring at that point you know because of what i like it just doesn't work for me <laughs> but really it was because i went through all this yeah. mental load. Yeah. and i think the nfp with an nfp with assembled with enough experience it's like okay this is what it usually happens because they'll have a lot of experience of like okay this has happened 20 times before and then once or twice it wasn't this thing yeah so it's like i said it's like okay this is probably this and then they'll know how to f and they'll probably follow up naturally yeah yeah and i mean there's a level of interest i have to know how something will work out but i think it's one of those things that um 
for sevens and for ENFP, I think it's both of it is, is accepting something as it is. So as wonderful as everyone can make something be in the world. I, I think one of the reasons why ENFPs can read people well is yes, there's the magical power, but there's also the fact that they're very curious and like will interrogate people for information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. There's a, well, because it's like, oh, well, why? You know, because we know that there's reasons we might think something. Yeah, we do do that. That's so funny. Mm. So what, what do you think this is a thing as well, though, the rapport? And do you think this is like a, a good way or, or at least how FI people work with people? Do you think there is more of an emphasis on the rapport than on, say, the objective part of like reading someone? It's more about how they feel towards the person. Um, yeah, for me, when I read that, um, to enter someone else's world and to make them feel that you understand him. I literally am trying to do that. So it's, and it's in a, such a non-judgmental way. It doesn't matter what way they vote. It doesn't matter, you know, any of those things. It's just to understand why they feel the way they do or why do they believe what they believe. So I do think that's very um, objective. Yeah. And so that's how, so this folks is what I think is the mechanism of how sociotics ethics of relations work. And so, and that is why, and it's, and it's usually, and a lot of the time it's based around shared values. Mm -hmm. So it's just, so it's almost as if MBTI FI is the mechanism of socionics, uh, ethics of relations, because it's like that, that's the sort of the content of it that's being used to judge the, because it's not a magical ability to judge to read this thing in the air between people it has to be based on how you feel about the other person and the connect the the level of connection there mm -hmm. and that all has to do with empathy and stuff and putting yourself in another person's shoes and making those uh connections because it's that imaginatively putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, the vicarious thing yeah uh, yeah for sure and there's sorry. times it doesn't happen I mean, if I'm talking to someone and they're telling me something and it just ethically isn't in line with anything that I can really sympathize with too much, there's times I <laughs> don't stay with it a whole long time. But I, but I'll try, you know, I try to do it, and I. Hey, I you know. have like, like, um, uh. Is, is there a point where like half of you has been, well, that's discussed, that's mostly disgusting, but it is interesting. Go on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can usually find something that's like, because there's nothing that's like purely evil in my eyes or wrong, really, where I'm like, I usually like, try to find a way to make it okay to listen to, you know? <laughs> it might be, that is a crazy idea, and I really hate that, but I'm curious as to why you think that. <laughs> it's like a train wreck, just watching the train wreck yeah. come through. Yeah, no, I haven't heard, but most people still try to, to say it in a way that doesn't sound too harsh for themselves. So, yeah, oh. there, there's definitely value things. And then there's a thing there, um, easily guesses what another person is striving for. Yeah, I think you, you covered that uh, oh, yeah. before. And then, then we've got a bit here about learning quickly. And I've, uh, I've written a bit about this. Because uh, I'll see if it's true for you, because this is an example of how I think uh, any works. Uh, and it's what I was able to do when I was at university. If it was something that I could relate to something I already knew, then it was like boom, 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 boom. Or if it was like just based on a couple of premises, then you could do that thing. But when it's like com something completely different, it's like, oh, no, let me try and get all of this. And it might actually be slower because I want to try and get all the pieces together. Because that's what it was like with NLP, because it was like, it was something completely new. And mm -hmm. there was like all lots of separate bits of information. And I was like, no, I need to see how it's all connected first. A, so that I can understand it and B, so I can mem memorize it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So you know what to do with it, because it's not, yeah. um, I had the same experience. I was trying to do the one practice and I didn't have an emotional anything to use. And so I couldn't really test it but I was chosen. I didn't have enough time to, you know, pick what I wanted to adjust. Yeah. So, and also, but, I, th I think John Grinder would say is like, well, 
you're not supposed to use a technique you just you're just supposed to concentrate on the other person so much that you respond naturally which is very much like in acting where they say because i've read a book called directing acting directing actors by judith weston and basically yeah. it was you place all your concentration on the other person then you're not going to be self-conscious about your own performance and then you're going to react naturally to that person and and i would say i and i was somebody who was in a school play and it really helped that everybody else was so good or at least i saw them as good at the time yeah. i couldn't act with anyone who was bad <laughs> Well, it's the, the presence, it's being present in anything is so important and so powerful. I think for, you know, the moment you stop, if you're worrying about something, it's, you're not present. Right. And, but we, with the practice that, that it was, was taking a, a, a something that had a, something you wanted to change, a situation you wanted to change and, and just, you know, dissolving it over, visually dissolving it, emotionally dissolving it. And I, you know, you need to start from a good place, something that actually mattered. Um, but it, but it was a neat practice. So I think that is something that I'll want to work on. But most of them, it was a lot to take in at one time if you're actually going to be um, proficient. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like NLP can work with um, change. I mean, if it's something that's really extreme, like uh, PTSD. Um, he talked about it once, John Grinder, where he almost had to do, I think he called it a double dissolution mm -hmm. of, uh, and I, I think there, the hypno, uh, there's a good channel out there, folks, if you want to talk about the, uh, it's Sp uh, Spartan Life Coach, where he, he talks a lot about, and he's honest about the good and the bad parts of NLP, such as like, there's certain bits that don't work as well, but it's really the business part of it that uh, he doesn't like, the way the courses are run and things. Oh, but yeah. the actual material, and there's so much material out there, you don't need to go on a course. No, no, it's amazing. Like, actually just watching, just the fear. I think, I think almost ha knowing that these things are real and being aware of it makes a little difference in it, that, that people's face can change. You're talking about something that they're upset about and it's it's the, the you just linked an emotion to the experience and every time you're saying it it's going back down that road again i think there's truth to that one of the intp things i do is like i will look at say the definition of something like calibration mm -hmm. and i'll think are they sure they're using the word right there and i'm like <laughs> looking at them because it's like it has to this word this metaphor has to exactly fit or i will be annoyed and so yeah. it's like, I looked at calibration. So in the dictionary, it would say something like, okay, you're, you're measuring something against a fixed standard. And the only way I could sort of interpret it was, okay, the other person is the standard that you're, ju you're just in your behavior to, based oh. on their reactions to you. And that is like a very effy point of view, where it's yeah. like, your mean your intention of the communication is irrelevant all that matters is the other person's reaction to it so it's like if i goes out the window and i suppose this is how nlp can be seen as manipulative if say somebody's just using it completely say expediently to like completely adjust to the other person and say what they want them to hear oh yeah but but okay, when you are putting yourself out there and you're letting someone else give you that feedback, like if you're expecting that feedback and someone else has to give you that feedback, then you lose that power over it, you know, feeling okay. Because what if, like, like the man with the CD, you know, I somehow made him feel better. It was a, if he was being objective, he would have probably seen how my opinion from it, I didn't realize that he was offering it to me. I do think, though, that once people get into the mindset of putting all their concentration on the other person, that initially they might do it for a manipulative reason. Mm -hmm. But it, as they develop, they might see the fact, well, because they're concentrating on the other person, they, they might notice something like the feelings of the other person and then develop yeah, more sort of like <laughs> FE based like, feeling in that way. So because mm -hmm. we could do a hangout in future with sasha nevian who like said he used he said that he said he changed from entp through to enfp through 10 years of hard nlp work <laughs> wow that's cute and now actually i want to switch to him that sounds fun <laughs> <It's so weird. laughs> 
Um, but, well, I, well, I like yeah. the idea of working on these things that don't come as naturally, but uh, but also yeah. I like the idea of the awareness with the Enneagram and all this, all, all the emotional awareness to stop letting other people hurt your feelings or upset you or take anything from you. But that's seven saying it. I think you'll love Dario's book, Eight Keys to Self Leadership, because Dario is a huge NLP. -er. And I'm not saying that out of school, folks. It's mentioned in no, the Dario him. Lights NLP. And uh, so, um, Eight Keys to Self Leadership, it's, it's it almost a combination of NLP and the functions. And funny enough, we can link it all together. Yes, <laughs> we can try to anyway. I see. Oh, and that I brings us. <laughs> And that brings us to this point here, and okay. we'll come on to it in a moment about the pluses and minuses of finding links. Um, oh, I don't know what those are. Let's look. Um, learns quickly, for she is able to grasp the main points of the issue. Has well developed faculties of. Okay, we'll talk about that bit. Learns quickly. And I've written here NP insider tip. Especially if the thing being learned can be understood by making links to what one already understands. Mm. Is that what you usually do? Yeah, not even realizing that that is what I was doing. Yeah, because I like to understand a concept. Like I need to get it, what it, what it is. Um, and then once I do, I'm good. And I do yeah. typically do it pretty quickly. So and then we've got here the... Um, the smart any break types, and what I've done there, instead of mentioning two types, I've mentioned all four because okay. there are two types. Because socialites, ESI, ethical sensory introvert, people of that type do exist, and people of the type ISFP also exist. Now, I believe that Vic, now, my personal opinion would be that if Victor typed, say, a Kersey ISFP, he might type them as something like sort of an introverted subtype of, say, ESFP, mm. I would think. And I think the same for, say, a Kersey ISTP, MBTI ISTP. He might say, oh, that's a reserved example of, say, ESTP. Because LSI and ESI are so different. I mean, it's in the names. He calls LSI Inspector. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the name of ISTJ. And then he calls ESI Guardian. Yeah. So it's very different. But what they all share in common, though, is... And, and, and all of those types of people, I, I believe, exist. So if you want an example of LSI, Vladimir Putin. Mm. LSI. Uh, he's, he's more LSI than he is ISTP or uh, ISTJ. Um, but they, they do not like to do... So I'll, 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 I'll just read this. Uh, smart any break types would point out the, the danger of that. Filtering out what doesn't fit one's existing knowledge base in order to concentrate on the commonalities. And yeah, I mean, I can see that. But yeah, they're just not open to it. Yeah, so, so SJs are probably more likely, because they do the anything, but they'll do it in a more of a rigid way of this is what I know, this is what I know, these are the generalizations, these are the procedures. And if it doesn't fit, they're gonna be resistant to it unless it's I mean the the ES I mean for an ESTJ to accept a new thing that's outside of their knowledge base. Mm -hmm. It would have to come highly recommended as there's this new thing that's a lot better because they, they, they would see the dollar signs and say, okay, I will change because they're seeing the dollar signs. But even Absolutely. then, it, there's going to be the, the natural preference would be there to stick with what they know. And so in about the last six months, I have been thinking about how do SJs use any and Eerie. I think it's actually part of the SJ-ness. They but, reject but, it. They they push it away. It's bad. What they like is it's, no is good. It's it's like it's not the way we use it. It's imagine if 
you used any and you you had far fewer ideas far fewer frameworks you saw far fewer or now say it was like if somebody showed you the connections and you really liked the connections but you couldn't come up with the connections yourself and so that's what the lower level ne i think is they like the connections they like the generalizing a different context it's just that they can't come up with it themselves as well whereas the np is we love a generalization we have that and then we come up with another one and another one and another one and another one yeah. so <laughs> even though the function is the same it's like but, but we aren't as consistent because it's new generalizations new 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 do you see what i mean so it's that you can because they love a procedure so imagine what an estj would be like without a procedure They've got oh, yeah, that extra yeah, yeah. practical thinking. You, yeah, give, yeah. you give them a standard operating procedure and it's like, boom, you've just given me a framework to use my extroverted thinking, my practical thinking against because they're going to be running everything by what is standard operating procedure. And mm -hmm. so anything which is standard operating procedure is going to go across different situations. And so ISTP, they're going to hate standard operating procedure because they're any break. And they're going to go, no, it depends on, yes, but does, does the standard operating procedure fit the specifics of this situation? Mm. No, it doesn't. And then I'll throw it out because their natural preference would be the specifics of the actual situation. Whereas the SJs would look at the specifics of the situation and maybe only concentrate on those things where they and and this this is another example of how they use any so an sj if they were a robot and they're not a robot but if they were they've not just got one yeah. algorithm there are things to connect to they're close but it's some of them they're they're close but so it's like they've got a lot of things a lot of frameworks that they can find connections to when they come across a new situation so they come across a situation and they will make the link of okay, this is what you do in this situation. And I've got this whole toolbox of techniques, but it's still a case of they have to make the connection between the present situation and then the technique. So they are, they are doing the anything. It's just they're using it in a lot more low-key way than the NP is. And the irony is, is that the way they use any, it results in the rigid behavior. So it's weird that, it's the rigid behavior is is because of the ne but it's an any where they can't come up with the generalizations themselves they have to be supplied with it absolutely well when what i've heard about it too is, is it's coming from like ours is coming from a positive place it's coming from hopeful it's excited it's happy about a new idea and yeah. they're going from it like a uncomfortable unsure at least the way that i it, it kind of like we do that in reverse uh, we do that with the past stuff, like that's boring. I've already done it. What you know? What am I going to get from that? You know, some of it, like a, it's a negative. I the way I I believe it's attributed is just that <clears throat> not not a good experience, not positive. It doesn't sound like a great idea, and I think because they don't like to create, they don't want to risk it not working out. Yeah, I think with the STJs especially because. I follow a lot of stuff on military technology and that lot, and I know about these long term projects. And if you change something just one little thing that makes it a little bit better but it has so many knock-on effects uh -huh. and um so the sjs might be like no we're not changing it we're sticking to the plan everything has been planned out we've got all the machine and the tools and ready for it we're not making this change i think maybe sfjs may be more open to an idea so for example my grandmother when she was 80 traveled to australia so it's like, again, it's, uh, if it's an idea for, oh, we could do this thing and we go together and do this adventure, some things, that's a little bit of any. So yeah. if it's a social aspect to it, oh, we could go this place together. And so. And it might have been on with company that she's comfortable, people that, you know, there's. Yeah. yeah she the but that's a big thing, though. I mean, that is a long flight, maybe a 12 hour yeah. flight at age 80. Yeah, now it sounds rough. I'm after a few. I'm ready to pace yeah, but, <laughs> down yeah. the aisles. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, I, I I think maybe so. It could be argued that 
the ST chain, STJs don't do the NE thing. Not, not so much because they're bad at NE, but because they're running it through the filter of TE. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, okay, so you want us to drop this plan that we've all planned out and then go on to this other thing because it's more interesting. Yes, I can see it's interesting, but hey, I ain't getting my eye away from the ball of getting this particular thing achieved. Yeah. Well, with SI, with it being so um, experience based, and, you know, that goes in the category of I know for sure, at least that's how I believe from the ones I'm close to and I know well is like this is a the only reliable information is what i know for sure and that's right. what i think goes in their si and the rest of it's like you know just where it just it's just so funny how different i can i look at that and i'm like oh yeah no that's it just is a very different outlook but my my si is not as fun i guess is there <laughs> i suppose these because there's four different types of intelligence it's almost like a game of paper rock scissors where in certain situations it's great to have a logistical brain and get it all right. Say in retail, where you get everything right, it's razor, razor thin margins, and you just get all the logistics right. And you have a situation where, like Walmart, where all the logistics are right and the razor thin margin. Um, in something more entrepreneurial, that wouldn't be the place for SJs. Oh, no. They're enforcers. I mean, they're follow. They're handling the routine. They're enforcing the rules. They're, I think, anyway, that they do that amazing. You give them a to-do list, and that's where it's really funny. I think I notice a lot of these preferences, like when uh, just someone asked Jay, I love and know, and I mean, she's going through the list, and it said she needed this form. And I was asking, well, what's the form for? She was having trouble finding it, and then I find out it's just they had wrote it wrong. They wrote the name wrong. And this is adding like double time to this poor lady who's doing the list exactly as she thinks it needs to be, but it was wrong. And so, you know, where if you take another approach and a more ENFP approach is well, why do we need it? Because then I'm going to decide whether I want to spend the time finding this form, figure out if I need to do something else to fill that need. Yeah. Or, I, you know. I, mean, I mean, these days, even though I haven't got a preference for that kind of behavior, I would think, why do we need it? And I think lawsuits. <laughs> that was just the, yeah. you got to dot your eyes and cross your teeth. You don't want that just that littlest thing. Yeah. Well, that's where someone else needs to come in. And and so that that but the cute part and the funny part to me is that she's not asking that. She's doing it because it's on the list, and that's what you right. do. Gotcha. Whereas right. it goes against every part of my being to sit yeah. and be like, why but, do I need to do it just because it's on there? But, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's almost, mean, as if, no, it's almost as if where you've got the preference and the behavior where, where where you've got so many regulations like and then you've got the possibility of being of, like the threat of legal action is so high that it's like it's almost like forcing you to at least you will act sj ish just yeah. defensively and be yeah. tied down and so you can see it with all of these say sps that we're going to start a business say as a plumber or anything and it's like they have a this huge burden to get through. Yeah, well, you see, I mean, I see it a lot in every day. I mean, you can type people just seeing how they do the work, you know, it's so yes. funny. You know, we've got lots of different that, uh, contractors. That is great. If, if you, we're going off topic, but I don't care. That is a great <laughs> thing. Did you tell us about that? Oh, no, I was just, it's so funny. You're like, you're talking about it. So people who don't show up when they're supposed to be there or they show up and it's a mess and they're making a mess while they're doing it or they're, you know, just the attention to detail where if you have like a, an ISTJ, yep. they have a different attention to detail than an ESTP. Yeah. And if I have, and, and you know, we'll work with all different types of people and just watching them in their natural environment of what they're working, it's funny. Does the ISTJ notice things in relation to a standard, the things that don't match a set standard, whereas the ESTP might notice something that's outside of that checklist that the ISTP is measuring things against. Yeah, I think it's just like the example I gave with, you know, like the one I know, ISFJ, and she's going off the list, and I'm ENFP, and I'm saying, why do we need the list? Where yeah. if we're using the strengths and, and weaknesses of both, which you can see both, I think, is that you know she's going to get the attention to detail right to a fault 
because she's actually wasting her time because she's not catching the mistake because she's so busy focusing on the list. Right. Where same for me, in my opinion, with watching an ISTJ who's, you know, focusing so intently on doing it right. And ESTP is going to adjust for the circumstance, maybe. So you might have a situation of, uh, if you're looking at a thing, and I think some NTs can fall into this trap as well, where they might think, well, I didn't know to check for that. It's not one of the criteria that we're using to assess it. Whereas in the SDP would like, because they, they, because they are so malleable and they don't have, and they, are, they have any preconceptions, they might just notice an error but there's an error in terms of logic. Well, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, it's that the ISTJ has to have that, the standard operating procedure or the checklist, a standard to measure against. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ESTP doesn't have that standard. Their only standard is, is it dumb? Would it work? Is it illogical? They, they yeah. might go, well, that won't work. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I definitely see that. And I think that's where the strengths and weaknesses come in because if the ISTJ is so stuck on the standard that yeah. they can't adapt when needed in normal everyday events, you know, where you, you follow what I mean? Yeah. I remembered something that Wojtek said about his father, the ESTJ he ran a business in Poland and he said he read, he read everything on a, a particular book. Uh, and so, so he said, so, no, sorry, he read, everything on the, he read every book on a particular subject and he said he initially didn't didn't believe him but then he realized and so you so maybe you can think the more intelligent uh sj is they're not just going to be like buy one book they're going to be like they're going to read pretty much all the books they can on how to do a particular thing so it's like they're going to have all of the like techniques there so be mm -hmm. technically very good all the ways look look for keep up with all of the what are the new trends coming in that people respect and have been endorsed so it's not just a case of oh i'm going to stick to this way of doing it that i've been doing it for 40 years i'm an unthinking robot but the real smart ones are going to have all of these different techniques and procedures that maybe new procedures that are coming from people that they've respected say some say somebody in business yeah. like that someone who's got a good reputation, like someone like Jack, Wil Jack Welsh, say he writes a business book, how to do things, they might read that book because it's the respect that comes in and the authority. And so they'll have all of these different techniques. And I suppose so you, you've got that. So you could say a really well-developed kind of, well, we'll put that in the SI book here, the, at least the way MBTI defines it in Dario, even though I don't think it's like that. Um, but you have, um, then you have the situation where they're then able to know from experience to go away from the standard operating procedure mm -hmm. to say, give somebody else their head. And that's why I wish people would watch that video that we did on the ESTJ oh, character yeah. because I'm we talked about I that. My, I have it on my list still and I didn't get away. Yeah, you could be the way. person to watch it and leave I, a nice comment. <laughs> all the way to the end. I'll watch yeah. it all the way through. Well, I think you love it. I think that example you just gave is like the best way to me how I see SI being like a great thing is if the person actually is taking in other things. If they're only going off of, you know, well, this is how my parents showed me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. You know, nothing else. No life experience of learning other ways. Yeah. Um, that Then I think that their attention to detail is something special because they have yeah. so much. Like I work really well with them different ways of doing it but um yeah i like that idea next time you work with an stj you could actually ask them to actually find out their process about whether they do sort of like update their techniques so there's yeah. almost as if you can get really cheeky how often do you update your robotic algorithms <laughs> right i know i love to ask them. well i do like to ask questions about what someone's interested in and things like that but the what a lot of the ones i know don't don't read a whole lot um will like to watch a lot of political things no maybe more estjs i know i think that's it love to love to argue the points they already love to argue which is funny yeah. i don't like to talk i don't really i don't really worry about that too much because i'm worried, worried about that every day 
and it's because they, well they are natural leader types ESTJs. A lot of the American presidents have resembled that type. Uh, but yeah, and they're, they're, and they're in charge. Style. That's a good hangout to see all the way through to the end. The one with um, Carol Linda interaction styles, and then there's the one on quadras as well. I know that's oh, a long yeah, one. On I have that. I'll do that while I'm driving tonight. I've got a, we'll yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a um, all this noise disturbance in the middle of the quadras one, but it doesn't uh, last for last for last for long. Uh, oh. Uh, so there's a bit here. Uh, has well developed faculties of fantasy. Often thinks up stories with entertaining plot lines creates imaginary scenes and events easily envisions and conceptualizes Ooh. oh yeah no i just i and i share my visual is very visual person and i will make myself laugh with some stupid ideas all the time um the yeah so that's, uh, oh well i was just going to say the where it's talking about the learns quickly and able to grasp the points i think that goes with the skimming where we have to be careful to not right. miss anything important and I actually have learned over time to go back and double check it again. Because I, even though I know my intention isn't to miss something, I wouldn't want someone else to think it doesn't matter. So I try to catch it. I think with a lot of things though, because you've, you've read you, you, the things that you read, that you'd have read the same kind of thing in the same format so many times, you, would, you just need to be a little bit, okay, I know where they're going with this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and then people get really wordy sometimes you know depending on yeah. how thorough and detailed which you know now it's now i'm finally at a place in my life that i can really appreciate the thoroughness you know I, if someone's building a bridge i want it to be that guy you know someone who's yeah yeah they're the nt to do it properly right i don't yeah. you know measure twice cut once you know or, or if anything actually i'll probably want an sj to do it really because they're really, like extra safe yeah but uh, you know as far as like the engineers yeah. architects all those guys that are doing all those yeah. We want detail. We need detail. We just need it in the right place. Because not giving like the message to me. Because an ENTP might want to try a new wacky design for a bridge. You know, <laughs> or try it out on your own family. Oh my gosh! <laughs> no kidding. Very so, so you you don't want to. You, so you're not telling me about your fantasy. That's fair enough. Um, <laughs> I am very visual, and I've said more than once, like. Okay. Just whenever I'm doing anything, I do get a visual with every single thing. Uh, my idea of interpretive dance when we're explaining things. I mean, we're a little childish and fun in that way, I guess. Um, things, stories of entertaining plot lines. Yeah, most things I'm entertain literally entertaining myself most of the day. Um, but I don't have trouble. Like, if you start to explain something to me, I usually can visualize and run with you, provided you give me enough yeah. detail what you're thinking uh this one's interesting gravitates towards talented and unusual personalities um i don't know what i say it's gravitates it like we're out looking for them and i don't think that's the case but when we're talking to people someone who's telling you something you've never heard before is is really exciting because um anfps often are sevens and right. we love to gather information like five so you know so that's what I was sort of asking you to, because I was wondering if you would bring it up before. So I'll ask you, so which, which one of these camps do I fall into? The talented or the unusual? <laughs> both. I think you fall into both. I love that you're interested in all of these things. But you do do it lightly. I mean, well, I guess you do it more detailed than you show. Um, so because I could see seven and five in that. But, but I see five in me now, which is so funny if you... You know, just over time, you kind of refine some of yeah. those yeah. seven. Yeah, that's one of the things that that is an example of looking at the world through a model, and maybe there uh, a mistake coming up in that if you completely TI it, where you look at okay, I can see how ESFP can be TI break because they really are, but when you look at ENFP, it's like yeah, but yeah, but they're abstract though. So they're not going to be as TI break as ESFP. And you sort of have to twist the definition of TI to mm -hmm. sort of like, doesn't like boring procedural bookwork, something like that. Yeah, yeah. With, 
rather than saying they don't like like theories. But they do like theories. Which ones are you saying don't like theories? Well, that's what I mean. Is like you almost have to like twist the definition of TI when you try to explain how an ENFP is um, TI break. I don't think of that as TI, but I'm not as you know better than I do. Probably, and that's not my strongest one to explain. Like I can't explain introverted thinking very well. Uh, extroverted thinking, I think you get. I, I think I'm better at through profession, self-employment, you know, you learn that kind of stuff. Um, So TI, I don't think of that as theories, I guess. I think if I'm strictly going on the Jungian definition, then if you're learning somebody else's subjective thinking, is it objective think is it is, does it then become te for you and i think if you're strictly going by carl oh, jung's definition yes it is because it's from outside of you and other people will agree with it so it's a consensus and it's that's then in the te realm so for example you if you so it's like say um say all this say all of this enneagram stuff was all of the had the had the, had the approval of the church then the sjs <laughs> would be like this is objective and we're learning it this isn't a true story i mean i i'm i'm in texas right now and that's how it is um but so the difference i think is that maybe it's a te that does this but i'm not just hearing one thing and running with that the per i have to go and listen to every version of it and then i'll pull mine or 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 what makes sense what's more efficient for what i'm trying to explain even you know like i i still think it somewhere that the eye break is still there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it actually explains it a bit. It actually explains it quite well in this, in the uh, on the next page. Uh, so uh, I sort of buried the headline now a little bit. But oh, here we go. There we go, the, the top one. And it, oh, yeah, that's where it matches. So what I'll do is once we've looked through that, I'll, uh, in fact, wait a minute. I could. Is there any bits that... What page is that? Okay, okay, that's the first. Oh, yeah, that was at the top of the second page. Okay. Um, but this, this bit here about um, disparate threat, what I should have done is showed people this bit here, the creative FE yeah. in the model G. That's the wrong graphic. That is, you know, it looks like the right graphic, but um, I've actually put in a substandard graphic in there because it's not uh, an SVG file. SVG files are very difficult to send to people. You, you can't send them to them over Facebook. But what oh. it does is it's a graphic that will rescale so that it has absolutely no blockiness on it uh, at all. Uh, I'll just show you. So you can see there how it gets a bit, a bit blurry. Oh yeah. Right. So, uh, so people are uh, learning a little technical thing. So that's a that's a PNG. This should be the this is the scalable vector graphic. And so when you close in, it just rescales. It, it never ever gets blocky. It's just super. Oh short. yeah, that is really nice there. Okay, but you can't send these over Facebook to people. I, I can only send the. Uh, the other ones and so this is a bit that relates to the thing before so we'll just have a little quick look at this uh so folks can uh see that and um, we won't talk about this too because uh, there is a separate video on this if you yeah. see it with carol linden it's about two hours and we're talking about uh enfps and the creative use of what we what we put in the fe bucket as so basically enfps can do loads of stuff that involves being uh changing the mood of other people and reading the mood uh Mm -hmm. of other people yeah and it's funny when i was yeah i definitely do think we do that i mean we use fi but this is real because well because our goal is to keep the harmony and to be compassionate i i'm pretty sure i know it is for me um so i think we have to be using some fe there but it's just like a different way of using it yep Mm, that was a 
just it took a so while the to... strikes to manage others' feelings and uh, and agenda. Uh, this is, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I was just saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go on then. I'll. Uh... Oh, there we go. I think on five, you know, where they're discussing the, you know, how we will complement, you know, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's to be manipulative. Um, it's to be. I, I may not have told you this before, but if you click on my square, it will then stay. Oh, will it? Square. Oh, good. Okay, so just stare down at you, and you're like an inch. <laughs> okay, there. It's a little bit better, like engaging. Uh, so I'm not staring at the bottom corner. Okay, perfect. Well, I like the way that that describes it because I think that's also where we have to be careful that if we that we're not pushing an agenda that's self-serving. That's where yeah. it comes in. That what we're doing is trying to be objective, which is true for all types, not just for ENFP, right? <laughs> do, you, do you notice this bit here that that this was also in that profile where it says here gets offended after not receiving the emotional feedback, and that was in that that profile that we're looking at now. Okay, yeah, no, I yeah. can, oh, yeah, I can see that, no. We can see that. So because they are you know complementary, folks, these two profiles. They are, they link. And you get extra stuff about advice for the type and then what they're like as a leader and then what they're like as a subordinate. So yeah. uh, we will go over these in future when we look at the NFs and their uh, creative function. Uh, so we'll go through this and then I'll show people the NE minus a little bit, uh, but not too much. So what we got here, people generously, I'll just get the previous line, knows how to encourage and inspire people, generously gives compliments, enthusiastically describes future activities and prospects, offers multiple solutions for addressing the same problem. Do you do that? Absolutely. And I mean, so much so that I can lose my audience if I'm not, if I'm not careful, because I feel like, especially SJs, because they'll get frustrated. They're like, well, which one should, you know, like they just want a, they want to know what they want, you want them to do. Right. And they don't want to go through like 10 different options, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, Victor referred to that when I kept to come up with different names for the, what we were going to call the functions in English. <laughs> like, I don't care anymore. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Find uh, finds it unbearable to occupy herself with repetitive work. Repetition oh, yeah. generates boredom, which strongly depresses her spirits. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's so so true, and that's definitely individual. Um, but I also have learned how to find ways to always um, make myself happy, upbeat, you know, and doing something to motivate myself. So I think that's also where we. I explore in my head or wonder about motivations of other people. So, um, yeah. keeps you occupied. Yeah. So, folks, we'll go through this in a different video, and we've gone through this with Carol Linden, and we'll we'll probably go through this with Alicia in future when we do the answer. But this is just so you can see the commonalities between uh, the two uh, profiles that we're looking at. And then this is just a little bit here, and I'll pause the screen so you can see how Victor is defined. Uh, any minus the kind of the intuition of alternatives that ENFP uses, and also uh, INTP as well, TINX. So, um, so what we got here? Uh, oh, here's a little bit of interesting stuff. I thought this was very interesting. This this next uh, uh, paragraph. Do you want to read through this and, until you get to a point that you'd like to comment on this that second oh, paragraph? Sure. Okay. Oh yeah, we did this. Um, IEE, like no other, is discerning in the logic of human relations, especially acutely he sees the causes and motivations that create complications and conflicts in intimate relationships and friendship. Gosh, that is so true. And that I can't not do. Um, very hard. <laughs> so if you see patterns, yeah, like in, you know, around you, like if, I don't know if you've ever seen a situation where somebody somehow magically finds a partner that is just like the last partner they had and the partner before that, this pattern. <laughs> oh, it's so weird. Uh, so that's hard. That's a real struggle. Um, or someone who might be taking advantage of someone or something like that. Yeah. That, oh, that. It, you might say, that's my type. And then you might think, yes, and your type's a dick. <laughs> yeah, so I do, <laughs> which would be something we might joke about, but with your good friends, and of course you're only going to use that sort of thing or, 
try not to pay attention if you can help yourself you can usually get the point across and then they know you're not trying to say anything except for out of love or care you know like i want the same thing i'm fine with feedback but even having someone say oh well you know you should never type someone i wouldn't be offended by that so i don't take that kind of feedback bad or get offended so i think that also is type specific um it's easier for i say her i guess instead of him it is easier for her albert to maintain the present relations that are running smoothly than to mend old breakups uh, I wonder if they mean in other people. This is also where any can go bad because you can never really chop people up. You can always see a uh, opportunity that people could get better. Yeah. That's one of the things I've noticed. Um, uh, quite a few of the ENFP resembling people will be a little in two minds about typology where they don't as much want to put people in boxes because it's that they'll say yes but people develop and change and I suppose to them you have to say okay these are how much somebody resembles a particular pattern mm -hmm. and rather than being fitted into a static box and even if though that is just mentally it's like especially if they're an e e7 resembler it's mm -hmm. like, no, I don't want to be confined even to an imaginary box. And then I, then you could come in and say, well, that's so ENFP. <laughs> Tell me that. <laughs> and already, and, yeah, well, that's what's so funny about it. It is funny, actually. My mom's seven. She says, well, I guess that's fine for people who need that sort of thing. As she, you know, yeah. it's just the patterns and it's just people do it over and over and over. It's so funny. And especially if you're already someone looking at patterns, which is an ENFP, I, you can't not do it. Um, so I guess that's where the stuff does become interesting to watch and see because you see how relevant it is and in typology. And, uh, but with any end up, I definitely can have the same patterns because you won't want to give up on people and you won't limit people to being in that one box because you can see it. Anybody could change or, or improve or so that can work both ways. I think up to a certain level, because there is a point where it depends how mature they are where they might reach a certain threshold where they'll make a value judgment about somebody because it contradicts their own values and then how they feel about that can get in the way of how they uh, read the other person because it is so subjective yeah no I'm sure what you're saying is a real thing for me I just haven't quite figured out what that is yet but I know um, I, you know, I'm always hesitant to give it a name, good or bad. Yeah. Unless it's something so outrageous, which might be developing FI more, um, where, you know, if you're doing that and maybe that's giving it more of a name, you know, yeah. uh, so you can, try, you know, put it in a box. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of things are going to be, most experiences are not going to, are going to be in the middle of those two poles. And then there certainly are things which okay that definitely is good and try and find somebody who will argue with that and then that definitely is bad and try and find somebody who will argue with that and then i'll point to that person and i'll say look this person thinks that's okay <laughs> well and if they are an sj they probably run with it you know i mean i guess yeah. it depends on whether whether they have to give it a title whether they whether they have to not include it and so an enfp i think that's one of the hardest things is because um I don't necessarily have to do that. And I, and like it says on here in other places, we can be pretty independent, um, self-sustaining all those things. And so, because you're not relying on other people, I think it does. I think it works both ways, you know, that, that we can also make that, um, work for us and work against us. Confusing, contradicting, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. He sensitively reacts to any. Oh my gosh! I can't. What is it? I need a. I need a definition. Oh, which, which one? Which, which, where, where are you? Which sentence do you start with? Antipathies. Yeah. Oh. Uh, is it an, well, where is? Where does it say? Um, Here, I'm saying it wrong. I'm sure. I don't which? Know. Which? Uh, yeah. Oh, reacts to any antipathies and animosity. 
gonna use that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna look that up. I know, right? It's I'm, an irony. I'm gonna look that up. And in fact, wait, I have a dictionary uh, to hand. Uh, I would think that ant is opposite of path is, and path is is when you have pathos and a feeling of uh, connection. Uh, so let's say antipathies. It sounds like somebody doesn't doesn't care about something. That are not because if someone has the pathos, then they let's say have antipathies. I like that you could take that and make that make sense. That was great. Um, um, is it antipathies? And mm -hmm. antip. This is a. Oh, antipathy, strong dislike. That's what it's put. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that kind of describes what I was just saying. Um, in that way, we can be very gray. There's not a lot of black and white with that. So yeah, when someone else is so um, dualistic, you know, when they're doing that, um, I think that does, it doesn't always go over well. And animosity, yeah, I, I don't love that. <laughs> that's, that's true. Well, cause I don't want to spend time with it. So I don't want to think like it and I don't really want to talk about it too much. So for me, I think if I'm not liking it, I'm not there, you know? Is that a little bit of the seven coming in and wanting to get away from the Absolutely. comfort? But it's also, for me, it's like if I can't, as an ENFP, if I can't be there in happiness and peace with the situation, I would rather not be than be there and making faces, you know? Yeah, and it's almost as if, well, I have other options of people I could interact with. But it, but I don't think of it in, from that angle. I truly am thinking of it like if I can't be nice to the person or something mm. like if I, if I just liked something about it and I can't be nice, I don't really harbor bad feelings, but I won't be around them because I know right. if I'm going to be around them, I might be, I wouldn't be happy. That's talk. interesting. That might be, that's more about that. That might be one of these left versus right spinning things uh that is a very ti dichotomy so it's like <laughs> it, it's based on something that is like mostly true but when you base something that's mostly true on something else which is mostly true and then something else which is mostly true then the, the level of um of mostly true might go down a little bit when you start building these different layers of mostly true on top of it um yeah. so we we'll, we could do a hangout in future with maria uh, with, with all the people joining where we actually go through each of the 16 types and say okay how exactly is this type a result type and how exactly is this type a process type so yeah. a type like say ENTP like how exactly is an ENTP a process type and mm -hmm. then you'd have to sort of like and I, and I would look at well okay well if I look at the way Kersey describes the role variant that best suits the ENTP's predisposition, and that would be to being an inventor. Because mm -hmm. uh, you might say something like, well, there's a long process between the idea, the design, and then de developing and perfecting uh, the prototype. And so there's going to be a process for that. So maybe that would be an example of them being uh, process oriented. Yeah, but that's also where different skill sets come in and yeah. strength because, you know, the person who came up with the idea is always the one completing the list. Yeah, that's so. the thing. Kersey thinks that and what he's almost writing about it as a career that corresponds to the INTP's skills because the INTP isn't good at the implementation, but they are good mm -hmm. at the design. And so I said, I suppose the INTP would be is more of a result type rather than a process type because it's like, well, I'm designing this new thing to get to this. And then it's like, although a lot of times there's overlaps where the ENTP will also be designing things. And then sometimes when the INTP is also developing a prototype, so that can show how in terms of their intelligent actions, if not their psychology, 
that they can be very they can op, op, uh, occupy very similar niches in an NT way. INTP yeah. and ENTP. Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. And the strengths where, um, I mean, gosh, that's so funny. Like that example we were just talking about. I mean, but okay, so what about the person who's there with the person they disagree with and they're not going to be nice to them and they're going to be sitting there and judging them the whole time? To me, the presence and being there and judgment of them isn't any better than choosing to not be. There might be seven. I but I would, what I would do with them is I was around that such person is I would judge them for being judgy. And it was like, right? I have a very low threshold for like people. Oh, this, this person is not a nice person. Boom, lost interest. Right. That, that's away. five, seven. I think one, five, sevens. I think there's like, I know in the fours, I don't know. There's so many triangles with this, but I know we do the seven and we, we do the five and we do the one. Yeah. With lines of connection. Yeah. Yeah, the lines of connection. And I think um, it was funny in the workshop last time. I mean, you could definitely see that tendency in all to not. We're trying, you know, everyone's trying to do the right thing. But, if you know, just a different way of going about it. So it's not, you know, like I don't ex like exploitation of others. I think ENFPs are against that in general. We're trying to be, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, I was just thinking that each, each, each type has a unique, has unique lines of connection. So it's only the seven that's connected to one and five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there is a triangle with one, four, seven also. And it actually was kind of funny because yeah. in the workshop, I really did just, the, we kept getting in one, four, seven um, groups. And right. it was, it was kind of funny because it was kind of an inside out version. Oh, so what is... What is your chart type? Are you one four seven? I don't know yet. Oh, oh no, we were in we were in um just group projects. They were having people, you know, uh, group off, really? and it was just kind of funny. But yeah, I don't know mine yet. I'd love to know. What I would think is, if you go too much off behavior, you might get pegged as a three fix. Oh yeah, because you, but but, it, but that might not necessarily be your preference. It might just have been a thing that you've had to get get at. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly the truth. But I'm, I tested seven eight or seven two eight in my in the progressive test, and then also seven nine four. So, but the more recent one was seven eight two. That would be a good thing to look at. Is in order to test. I mean, the strength of role function can be tested by looking at all the all the EPs and trying to look at their tri type and see how frequently eight pops up mm -hmm. in their uh, tri type or wing, because a lot yeah. of EPs are identified as seven. Yeah, but mine was, it was so weird. It was seven wing eight, eight wing seven, two wing three, SX SL, which is a lot of connections to eight. Does that you follow me? Because it was like seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three and SX. That's pretty eightish. I think Catherine's version of the eight, though, is very toned down compared to Naranjo's version of the eight, where his his eight is so eight that only an ESTP can be his kind of eight, because he's got impulsiveness in there. He's got sensory motor dominance. Yeah, and so when you when you put and rebelliousness in there, and so I'm thinking, well, ESTJ is not so rebellious and impulsive. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really fit. But the way when you look at you've probably done you've probably done Catherine's any of cards test. When you look at her cards for the eight, there's nothing in there where it's like what this would exclude ESTJ. Or ENTJ, yeah, okay. so it's it's basically it's basically towards uh, uh, to summarize her version of the eight. It would be someone who's in charge and someone who's protective. Mm hmm And considers himself strong, yeah. um, which I know she's refined that over the years. But I already knew too much when I got to it. So um, <laughs> I, I heard this great thing, uh, Peter Cullen, who does the voice of Optimus Prime. And he told his brother, and his brother was in the Vietnam War. And he said, "He's where are you going?" I said, "I'm going to do an audition to play a truck." 
and it says and it, really and it says and it says it's a hero truck and he said okay if you're gonna play him if you're gonna and, the, and so his brother was in the vietnam war he got uh medals and uh peter cullen really looked up to his older brother and uh they were living together at the time and he said okay if you're gonna make him a hero make him a real hero and then he told him what he thought a real hero was he said mm -hmm. a real hero is strong enough to be gentle and then all of these other things and so he performed did optimus prime's voice which came across as a strong but gentle voice and that to me yeah. sounds like that super developed eight that's got that like protective side yeah for sure well my dad was an eight i'm sure of it uh, he's been gone a long time but uh they're not always you know in the, the highest levels and the control <laughs> team the dominant i mean that's a real thing for not everybody's viewing the world through those eyes you know yeah. of, uh, control or be controlled type of an idea um so it's funny because there's times i was like well maybe i'm more eight than seven and i'm like no i mean my goal is not to uh you know go around and Good demand people. order <laughs> <laughs> not to be in and that's where one of the things with the interaction styles because then i could ask carol to explain the in charge interaction style and then i can ask Catherine. so how eight is this <laughs> <laughs> right i know but then so where ah. I feel it is how we do our own life. So, but they'll talk about seven wing eight versus eight wing seven. And there's a big difference. We're gonna, we will assert ourselves when we need to because someone else is taken over. Whereas an eight wing seven does it for control, I've heard. So what I could ask Catherine is, when uh, Carol gives her definition of the, cause I've got that written in my diary for Friday is, um, she gives a proper explanation of the in charge interaction style i can then ask catherine okay are there any eights that don't have that interaction style are there any yeah. eights that are not in charge or is that impossible i mean is it, is it fundamental to the eight that they have to be in charge or I want really to be in charge yeah it's got to be fundamental to it but I think that really does, like you said, with an ESCB, it just works. It's it's where their you know functions kind of go. And she's an ENFP eight, and she's not. Um, I think, I think she's also said. I mean, sometimes she said ENFP, and then sometimes she said in a different conversation. I think she said that she gets very close between. I think sometimes she said very close between ENTP and ENFP, and then sometimes between ESDP and the MTP. Uh, well, I, I think I see an N or an S doing all the tri type stuff though, could well, you? But she started off like so empirical with, oh, okay. um, uh, I, 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 I said before, like if someone isn't a clear type, there's not much point typing them yeah. because if they're not that clearly that type, then you no, know, it's not much point. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, for but, sure. I People's you know Dario's Dario showed like when he did the brain research that that the STPs can show can, can change so much that their brains can look like resemble at first an NFJ and so it may have been the, because Catherine said that she learnt it to to understand her baby mm -hmm. and before that she did all the Paul Ekman stuff looking at all of the facial reaction stuff a, a large attention on body language so she has a large attention on body language she has a large attention on the words people use so very mm -hmm. empirical and then she talks about having perfect color pitch and then the things that she was interested in she said mm -hmm. when she was in the fashion industry and so is she is she quote is an nf she had a lot of sensing points uh, yeah well as a yeah, I mean, I, her motivation makes sense that's for an the I mean, that's kind of mine too. Was always on that is you know. So it's, sure. and uh, I think some people can just develop so much that they fall outside of these models and are just too darn hard. Maybe should we could offer we should whip around and start a Kickstarter to have uh uh to get a Kickstarter to pay for. Catherine to be EEG'd by Dario so I should find <laughs> out like what the natural preference is and then versus the effect of the various careers she's had have had on her brain right I know do you think you, you can uh, have house parties maybe he'll show up with his machine 
Yeah, but exactly. they're in the same. I think they're in the same city, though. Oh, yeah, because oh, cool. both. I think I. I know that she's in California. I know Dario's in Los Angeles. Yeah. So you know, I think we could make this happen. Uh, you know, I think it's fascinating. I love that he does those because it shows and supports what we're talking about, especially yeah. when seventy-five percent, or at least that's what I've heard, are the censors. That I understand that it's like, why are we spending all this time? But it's just another way to look at it, the same issue. I think Farah is a good example of uh, somebody shows who shows the strengths and limitations of it. So that's a hangout I suggest everybody watches. It's the one with Victor that I think is the tw is the twentieth, and What's it's that? the one where I um, turned down the opportunity to blow the. Um, to blow the blowout to mark the anniversary because I thought that that was a little bit too obvious but, and I sort of played with not doing it and being drawn towards doing the blow. Um, blow dark. What bit was that? The other part of it is that it did work very well. <laughs> the actual <laughs> blowout. So if it had worked well, I would have gone <laughs> and that it all come out. No, this is open to the 20th hangout. Um, oh so we went, th it was three hours long. So you got three hours with Victor and we're going through e Farah's EEG data, all of her results of, wow. and it can be looked at by different typologies because it's, it, it, you, you don't have to buy it. So a socionics person, person can look at it and not buy into Dario's definitions of the functions because it's like, this was the brain activity when this particular task was performed and then any school of socionics can look at it and say, okay, that particular task lines up with how we see this particular function. Mm, okay. uh, so, so it's it, so, it, so we can, it's almost neutral in terms of a, a typology from that point of view. This is the Perfect. task and this is the activity. Now for anybody, because it's, it's like, is because he, because he's not presented it as her FE, her FI region lit up because then you would have to go, okay, what do you mean by, fi and then if he's got a different definition from us then it's like oh this is not you but it's like if you then say this region of brain lit up when she did this particular thing then you can then look at that particular thing and say okay what function does that correspond to in our system yeah and then different systems can then because it because it's more a case of looking at the raw data um and so we did that with Farah, and then we had this interesting thing and we also knew and this will really help to triangulate the situation. Uh, she used to identify as six, but then it came out she was a strong identifier as nine. Oh, really? And this gave her some, in my eyes, I interpreted as ISFJ-ish qualities. Yeah. But there were it... nine-ish things. Wow. Uh, and, the, and the key, the best bit is, is when we go through the FE break, and that wicked weird combination of fe break and enneagram type nine where mm -hmm. with fe break you would think okay this person's not expressive and they don't give a monkeys about what other people think but mm -hmm. when they're an e9 they don't give a monkeys about what other people think but they keep it to themselves for the harmony <laughs> <laughs> Which is very happy. <laughs> right. So, and I would never have thought about. It. So it's something like. So it's very hard in order to see the effort yeah, in a nine. Yeah. Well, what's funny is that some of the behaviors are similar, but there's the it's the motivators I think that you really have to go to because they can look like that, and and it's not the same thing. Like a two SP looks like a nine in right. a way certain behaviors and things and the isfj my you know when you cross over the behaviors si and fe when you say a 2sp do you mean a two self prayers or a two artisan no no i'm sorry when a i'm saying self -prayers. Self -prayers. yeah right, okay. i usually don't i i guess i do cross over yeah sorry right but there's some behaviors but then also um this is crossing over again i get a pattern again at the Condon point, uh, workshop, he also is bringing up the effect of parental influence. So yeah. there's so many factors that cross into people's um, experiences. Uh, one person, I mean, they couldn't even get a type. She can't even, after years of this. 
But it sounded nice. Pretty rounded individual. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny because I see that I could definitely tell reserved, uh, but it was also off parental influence, and you could yeah. just you do what her mother would have been like. You could just tell by her uh, behaviors. What? Uh, Dario did an interview with somebody. Uh, oh, I'll mention his name. It was, it was on Type Tips' channel. And he mentioned three things that also have a big effect on the brain, apart from... Oh, I've got to phrase it in an INTP way. Uh, the pattern of activity in the brain that is characteristic of people with INTP preferences. You see how much longer it takes to actually put yeah, things precisely. Sure. It's better to just speak in a lazy generalization. Absolutely. And, and so he says that 50% <laughs> is due to corresponds to somebody's type pattern. And then the other 50%, and then he named these three things. Career, upbringing. No, no, he didn't say that. He said, yeah, he said culture, oh, education, yeah. and career. Yeah. And then I thought, yeah, they're all important, but I'll add a few more. Uh, and so yeah, I, came up, I came up with the Ibukiki. And so it's like, you can think, well, an individual social status, somebody just might be very much respected where they are in their country. They're, they're, a certain country might respect a certain profession mm -hmm. very well. Uh, then the B part, massive, biology. Mm -hmm. what 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 sex is somebody how old are they all of these things that that can affect how people treat them yeah for sure and their experiences with things because i mean i think the instincts matter as much if not more than the enneagram personally and mm. i think Catherine Faber's work is like amazing it's absolutely the best i, I mean i've thought it out because there's no one else discusses that but i think it's huge as far as whether uh because it's like animal instincts it's whether you can tolerate something behaviors is one thing but when your instincts and she discusses that in your hangout but when they get you'll see it when people get upset something gets stepped on your foot gets stepped on with instincts you're it, there's no patience so what you could do is you could uh given that the given the, the yeah and it is going to be a zoom event and we'll, we'll try and work out the technology a little bit behind the scenes here folks uh so what you could do is because because i'm sure you've got a lot of questions for her but if you could angle her questions so that it's towards the the topic of the event which is looking at the enneagram and jungian combinations mm -hmm. then uh yeah. Then you get a lot of questions in there because it would be relevant to the uh, event. I can do enough FE to do that. <laughs> <laughs> R okay. Rather than, um, yeah, because it would be relevant to the combination. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I, I don't want to blow the minds of people who are not into the Jungian stuff right. and who are really into <laughs> Enneagram, but I think that they can take the four temperaments. Also because they're based around motivation and also yeah. Catherine is interested in words and actions yeah i just got both her books from her website and i haven't got to read them oh. i was so sad i didn't bring my charger on the airplane i bought it right before i walked on and i did is, is one of her books about words uh i haven't got i was trying to find the instinct things but i know she discusses it and i'm hoping she covers it i got her uh um I mean, uh, her subtypes book and the any style one right okay so you got the the instinctual subtypes and did you get a tri-type book actually i let me fix that i got any style and i got the tri-type i wanted the reason i forgot is because i couldn't read it <laughs> which is why i bought it right before i went on the airplane that right. so i wanted the, what i want was instincts and what i bought was the other two so that's any in action right <laughs> So, so if, you, if, if you continue, the, the reason why I think it's better for you to read it out is that you know when you want to stop and say something. <laughs> what do you mean? I'll read out the well, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, because sure. sure. otherwise I have to like read a bit out and then stop and say, do you want to comment on this? No, yeah. Whereas Definitely if you can it. just stop and comment whenever you like. Yeah, where were we? Um, 
Oh, okay. Um, oh, did you get to that bit underlining uh, pink? We'll talk to anyone if the person's interesting to her. Yeah. Oh, no, I'll, we'll do that for sure. I like it. I love just. They talk to me too, though. Actually, it's funny. <laughs> my son's noticed that. I could be just in line somewhere and apparently can be approachable. Um, charming and sociable will build relations with anyone if this person is interesting to him. And that's, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say build relations, but I could visit at length with someone. Um, I think we're kind of funny about who we, we can be very engaging without being real close. Maybe. Ah, yeah. And I think people can miss, I think what people frequently misinterpret with ENFP resemblers is that they mistake their general enthusiasm with enthusiasm for them. Yeah, that that can happen, which it is still enthusiasm for them. It's just not necessarily intimate always yeah. or even having mentally gone there or um, yeah, I mean, it's just a really it's, funny thing. It, you know. what, it, what it might be is when they encounter somebody usually is enthusiastic as an ENFP, it's usually somebody who's got the hots for them because yeah. they're showing that much off. And so that can be mistaken for that. And it says, no, 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 I'm just an perfect. ENFP. <laughs> yeah, which is so, it's so funny because it makes absolute perfect sense, even to me. But at the same time, it just wasn't something I thought about before. And then I felt bad because that happened before where it was like years ago. And you make someone feel bad. Or not bad, but, you know, where they might have taken. However, you know what I mean. <laughs> right. So I was just wondering, so this bit. So when it says that if the person is interesting to her, so um, what do you find interesting? Um, I love to hear about people's travels. I love to hear about this stuff. Anything like um, like the... You know, like when you're talking about people that you've, you know, might have talked to on your show. Uh, I love this stuff because um, some of these people like Dario, you know, who's studied all this. It's just, it's fun to talk about. So people who have like any shared interests, love that. But right. my interests are pretty random. Like I really literally know nobody else who reads the stuff I read. Right. So you can see there, I mean... So that's one of those examples of when, when we looked at the rapport thing before. Mm -hmm. So the shared interest with somebody, that will affect how you feel about the person when just, just with the shared interest. Yeah, or lack of, like in an in a yeah. intimate relationship where they can't or won't even try to get interested in the things that you're interested in, and that's a very seven thing, but you want to be able to experience things with somebody, and um, if they're not interested, it's hard to have that, you know? It doesn't have to be extreme and the same level, you know, but just some effort. I right? suppose when the NLP people who get really manipulative with it, but the people who are able to be manipulative with it are probably able to be manipulative anyway. And that yeah. is, they will pick up with what the person values and then they will feed those values uh, back to them. But yeah. I would think the more intelligent ENFPs, because they're so curious, is they would then ask about that, follow up to see whether they're just doing doing the old flim flam. Yeah, you can only BS your way through so much. You yeah. know, and that and there's vibes and there's things that come with it. So yeah, I think you're right that there's definitely a way. And I've seen it done, I've had done to me, where I could tell I was like, wait a minute. No, it's not there. That interest isn't there the same way. Or the manipulation, like for an, as an ENFP, it's so funny. Like there, there's something so inherently wrong in my eyes of manipulating someone that, uh, yeah, I couldn't, I can't, that, that falls in the, the black and white where I don't have too many. But I think it's because we could do it and we could do it well if we wanted to and we don't think it's okay to do. At least I don't. That would be an interesting stage play to do. Like, sort of like the, the master manipulator ESTP uh, trying to chat up the ENFP who's like, and it's like a battle of of wills. And it's like, yeah. it could just be like one scene at a bar, like this like battle between them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I had a relationship I think was, well, I thought for the longest time it was ESTP. I still wasn't 100% sure, but it matched a lot of the different things. It went on for years and years and years, and they like to win. They like to overcome things, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the easiest thing because the NFPs are a little bit more 
a little more fluid, you know? Just touch. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, it's not, not super concrete. I mean, I, I don't know. I think, um, uh, I don't know. I think it's a funny thing. But I just like the idea that everyone's being nice. And I know it's a little different for males and for females on that. Okay, on this part, perceptive of which distance he needs to keep with which individual and social interaction. Although he doesn't always hold it, or she, I should say. Um, actually, I would say that sometimes I'm, I've been off on that, but not very often. What do you think was the cause of that? Um, trust. Right. Because, because it is such a, sometimes we can be naive. Right. In our, it's an idealism in the sense that we think everyone is going for the same thing that we are. Right. That's not cool, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so that 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 uh, you know, but I still have to go every day into things and assume the best. Right. It's, I think that's part of the personality structure, maybe. Um, I.e. knows what needs to be done to maintain a favorable psychological atmosphere within a group. Yes, for sure. I mean, there's definitely um, an awareness, even if you don't want it. And But that's the kind of where I think we look at the... Uh, bits in this, which will sound like uh, ethics of relations, and then there's bits that can sound like Western FE, and then it's like, well, you have to sort of like tease it apart. Okay. Uh, and but generally, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, yeah, this does fit ethics, ethics of relations, uh, because that's pretty much what he's doing. I mean, because I because I, I know where it's coming from, because it's like it's derived from the functions, and but it is, but it, so it's a nice way of presenting it, though, and it enables you to sort of go out more of the confines of uh, an eight paragraph profile, which is what the model G profiles are. Yeah, I don't have to look and see if I have that because I don't have it on my... It's just that I put them into boxes so that it's more presentable. Oh, on there? It's not, is it on the page you sent me? Uh, What, the yeah. ENFP? No, oh, it's the ethics of relations description, like the way they... Oh, right. Oh, yeah, you want to... The way Victor describes it is it's a bit... It's not like this, but I would describe it as just that report stuff. I think okay. that's the mechanism of it is is having that connection yeah uh, and it could be values it could be typology it could be any kind of shared interest or background or yeah different things in the material of it yeah well and it's so uh it's funny because if i look at it and i think well what's what's the what's my motive you know which is kind of what enneagram takes you to do is to start to kind of stand back and pay attention to your own behaviors and what are you doing it for, you know? And it usually is just genuine interest in the other person um, to know, you know, or if they look upset. And so some of it's just kind of vibing with how something's going, if they seem like they're uncomfortable, things like that or whatever. I don't really see that too often, but luckily. Um, but there's usually not an intention behind it that's different. So, you know, I think the FB, the way that we use that is just to make sure everyone's happy enough and that you know yeah i don't think there's think, too much of i it. think sometimes i can see it as a tool mm -hmm. and then with with someone i know who also resembles uh enfp when they are a two as well and you've got that extra focus on other people mm -hmm. or say if they were an enfp resembler and a six resembler they would really want to fit in and then they mm -hmm. might have a little bit of a problem between the you know oh, authenticity yeah. and acceptance yeah i mean i think even in that situation yeah no i, I guess i could see that for i don't really know anyone that i can think off hand i mean there's so many things you could bring up and any i would think would take them into another subject so they don't have to go on the things that are uncomfortable or that would divide them it might also be that somebody who gets typed as ENFP six might just be it then becomes a question as to is like well somebody who might show six ish behavior because of things that have, have happened to them. Yeah, for sure. 
and functions and how you handle it. Yeah, so because we have yeah. to like keep a distance that it's just models, very good models, but yeah. we have to. Well, so that I would because I okay, so head types, so you got five, six, and sevens are on there in their heads. Yeah. And there's so so there's always that it's fear based, even if it's shaped differently. Um, and so you'll see that, but there's those patterns that you will see that divide that six and seven, in, in my opinion. Um, it's that hierarchy belief. So a seven does not want to, um, they don't believe that it's more um, egalitarian. You know, it's yeah. not, it's um, not the hierarchy idea. Like sixes have an authority. They want that authority and the authority is outside usually. Yeah, the, um, Jeff recently nailed it a bit with because um, one of the constant themes, one of the constant things I I asked him multiple times about this because Kurt Kersey has this dichotomy utilitarian, which is basically adaptable, do it mm -hmm. whatever way it works, versus cooperative, and he has the SJs as cooperative. And I was like, okay, I can see that, and he also has the NS as cooperative. Mm -hmm. Now I can see that, but there's differences with the SJs. And then Jeff put this little nuance in there that I thought that is brilliant because, and he said, they're either co cooperative with the ethics outside of them. And then here's, here's the, here's the oh, real yeah. bit of gold with their own ethics mm -hmm. that are cooperative with them. And so if you're, if you are cooperative and want to be consistent with your own ethics, and beliefs that will hamper your ability to do whatever is necessary to achieve the objective the way ASTP would the ends justify the means yeah so, yeah wouldn't go in line with each other they'd have to they'd have to rationalize it some way or another you know yeah. to be able to do it um but there's differences in the authority uh, the way that um because they do look similar sometimes I think, like, I mean, I know my family just close people. I can see the sixes and sevens because it's in the head and the fear. Those types, I think, because there's times right. it just has that that way. Um, but there's just those. There are other. There are things that are noti noticeably different. I think, and I've read a lot about the two types because of, I yeah. know in so many. And I've been there times. I was like, well, maybe I am, but um, but there's just a different. Whether you're asking opinions. Like right. an ENFP will like to talk about things because there might be an angle they didn't think of. Whereas a six will ask opinions for the, you know, authority to put the authority outside of themselves. Yeah, because they're insecure about how they should do do things. And you get a lot of this with Laura in about the last 20 minutes with the interaction styles hangout as to, and Carol was trying to, was teasing apart Okay, is this coming from an SJ pattern or a six pattern? Mm -hmm. And the key thing that Laura told me is that when she's on her own and when she's not doing it in order to fit in, she'll do it in a utilitarian way. She'll do it in the way that she thinks is best rather than the by the book way. Wow. Oh, yeah. They, they go back and forth. I mean, the ones that I know where my brother's is, and gosh, I see him. I remember seeing him do it. It's like question, 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 and then do something totally different out of just like can't sit around questioning it anymore, you know? Whereas sevens, like we'll play in our head about all the different ideas, but it's just for a different outcome. It's it's not it's not the same way. Um, so that so it's just kind of a funny observation when I've because I, I read every single thing I could on it out of curiosity on the differences. Yeah, I do think that oh, go when you got that when they got the seven and the the any dom, then uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of possibilities and entertaining possibilities because it's fun. Yeah, yeah, but if you get stuck in a loop, like I've experienced that before, that FISI loop, yeah. and if it's not good, that can stay. It kind of stuck for a while until I got so, myself out of it. So is that loop for you in terms of a practical example of that? Is this, is that just like churning over the same old feelings and not 
Yeah, it's well, it's true. It's churning over the experiences, past experiences, and how you feel about them. Past experience and how you feel about them. So that's how you get stuck right. in a rut, and F, an ENFP rut. That's what it was, and it was that was what I love about the um, functions. It's you know when you're like, oh well, shoot. <laughs> Once you know what that is, where it almost looks like a depression. What well, is a depression for someone? Because you're stuck. And then if you know, like, okay, readjust how you're looking at something or adjust something else. Because in, you know, real life situations, you can't always put yourself somewhere else, even if you want to. This thing that's something that's, that could be made relevant. If you, if you, if you can see if it was one of these, they have this thing called uh, the blame frame and mm -hmm. whether you're problem focused or, outcome focused and mm -hmm. the problem is if you're problem focused you then might start asking questions about why and why might lead to who's to blame for this and yeah. it's almost like you have a tendency to go back before you go forward mm -hmm. when you look at the problem because if you can't reconcile the problem then you're just going to keep going back and back and yeah. back and back to try to understand it. Whereas if you concentrate on the outcome, it's like, well, part of that process doesn't really involve looking for blame or looking for why. It's concentrating the thought process on how. And I realize it's a lot easier for people to do it with STP preferences than, say, NFP preferences, because if you're feeling what you feel and you've you got to try and ignore how you feel, mm -hmm. that's tricky. And they might yeah. think, no, I've got to work through this feeling. Yeah, for sure. And um, and then also, like as a seven, I think it's easier to do something that only affects you. Like you can make changes that are suiting you, but when if it's affecting other people, or you know, that that's when things get complicated. I think personally, for what choices people make, and as they get through, and careers, and kids, or whatever decisions people have to make. Um, awesome. When I mentioned cooperative versus utilitarian, it's within the realm of tool usage. So how somebody goes about uh, their particular task, uh, a particular social role. Um, and something that, that Jeff has said multiple times that I've only just now to get through my thick skull, and that is whether it's their first preference to be cooperative or utilitarian. Because ah. in the STJ, their first preference would be to be cooperative. And it's uh -huh. probably less of a leap for them than it is for ISTJ. Because they, but, but, but if you think of like an Enneagram A ESTJ, it, it doesn't take them that much to uh -huh. then like leap over to the utilitarian side and do it their way. But there's still going to be the preference there to do it the, the way that it should be done. Yeah, yeah, where we would go about that pretty differently, I think. I mean, we're cooperative. I mean, I can speak for myself, I guess. I, I am cooperative, but to a point. Yeah. It will, I mean, I know, um, like, if you read on the Social 7, that they'll look like a two, um, you know, which yeah. uh, Tom Condon talks about that you have all of it in you. So all the instincts, of course, some ride higher, you know, but... Um, so that one, you, you know, you're doing for others, you know, you're giving and you're doing it free will. Um, so we'll look like a two. Oh, how did I get lost on my thoughts? Jeez. Oh my it's goodness. Okay. What were we talking well, about? Well, when you were saying that, when you were saying social, when you were saying that, uh, a social seven can look like a two and then you yeah. also resemble an ENFP that made me think of this. Well, if you look at the, those functions in that social mission block of ENFP, you've got any oh, yeah. and FE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the, so if you, you're, you're the kind of ENFP with extra FE, uh -huh. and you're going to look a little bit like the social instincts, I reckon. Yeah, well, we were saying cooperative. Oh, yeah, that's what we were talking about, being cooperative or not. Um, it depends how you define in the FE, though, because you could also say, well... There's F, there's, there would be more like the MBTI FE, FE, which is a little bit E9 ish, like fit in. And that might also be not just FE, but FE with SI. 
Mm -hmm. because then you, you, you're moving away from the conflict. So yeah. it gets a little, how you slice and dice up these emotions. It's easier to slice and dice up logic than it is emotions. Yeah, well, in an ENFP, our, I mean, I, I should always speak for myself, but my motivation is not just to, like, make it go. Mine is to fix it. I, my energy, like, I'm not just passive in that way. Like, but when you go off of Enneagram and you want to go ahead and, like, at first when I heard fear of pain, I'm thinking, I'm not scared of pain. What? I'm not worried about that. No, it's emotional pain. So if you're trying to help other people so that they're not going to experience emotional pain also. So that FE, I think that's how, for me, that's how it kicks in is because it's trying to help them. But that's when it's also a little less, a little more directive almost because you're active, you're throwing verbs out. You know, you're trying to be suggestive. Yeah. Um, maybe like the body language would be like directive, even though the words might be. Uh, informing is just sort of going to come yeah. through. I like stop this. So it's, like, so it's like, so it's like, have you tried it like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. And then when I heard that described, I thought, oh my gosh, that is funny. I mean, even that, even that, where you think you're being helpful and you're being kind, you still have a motivation. You don't want to hear so, about the pain, <laughs> you know. There's a, a thing here where, um, oh, I got this right. Uh, yeah, um, there's something about, there's something that matches here with uh, the seven, with a wing eight, or, or a seven in the eight side with the ENFP. Mm -hmm. and that is the social adaptation block. And the type that is in that block for ENFP is oh. S-E-T-E, E-S-T-P. Ah. So that's a little yeah. mode where it, I think Model G would say when the ENFP can't get what they want, they sort of turn into a mini ESTP. How funny. <laughs> in, in order to a, achieve a particular objective. Our alter ego kicks in. Ah. That's funny. I could see it. I could see it. Well, there's times that I could be so incredibly present. And there's times you're a complete space cadet, you know, so it just depends on, on, on need. And I guess that's where the fact of actually being an extrovert comes out, you know. Right then. So, so that I don't go to bed too late. Let's see how we, so where were, where were you, where were you up to? It's almost two o'clock, which, where were you, uh, um, maybe we could, uh, what we could do is we could, when we get up to maybe the end of this bit in green, we could maybe stop uh, there. Have you got any more? Is it, say, so around this oh, this green sausage where it's about the R function and show to Carol, if there's anything extra in there, we could sort of stop at that point and then we can okay. continue from this point tomorrow, if you're free tomorrow. Yeah, let me see where we were left off. I think I'm right here. Okay. Oh, this. Okay. This is very two ish. This line is two ish. And I will have to think about this. She gives advice on how to interact and communicate with someone to become invaluable to them. That sounds so too. Ooh, very two. Very two. And I look like a two in a way, like my behaviors, but the motivations are so different. So that's the NFP too. That, that was funny. I'm going to save that. Um, no. I'm going to say a seven is doing it, but I, I mean, I want to feel like I'm helping. I like that. I like to, because I mean, shoot, you just learn about all this stuff. You're not doing it for nothing. You want to make sure your, your pattern recognition is right, that your ideas are accurate. So there's part of that that's trying to make sure that you're getting uh, feedback, I think. I think Model G would work it as it depends what mode you're in. If you're in a mode where you're, tw it depends how you're with the other. It's whether are you connecting with the person with say, are you in like any FE mode or any FI mode? And so the any FE mode would be you reading them, you get in the connect. You've not yet made that connection on a rapport level. You're sort mm -hmm. of doing it on a so so you say you meet and meeting a client or you're getting on with a client. There's not the rapport thing that's happening. 
but there is the the fe thing that's happening of reading body language and responding to it and, yeah and social conventions of etiquette and things like that and so i yeah. suppose it can depend what mode you're in and maybe you'd be more any fe in a business context i wasn't thinking about this for work i was thinking about this on a personal level but on a work level definitely that's different that's definite that's funny when i'm doing it well and not really advice on how to interact but when i'm engaging with someone work related i do i do want to feel like i know what i'm talking about and that i'm useful but that's also very important to my job right and that links up with because you would say i mean it's quite i mean one of the things says it and it's very close like we'll go we'll go over it later later on where it talks about because it does mention a thing and i'll put i put a big mark and said kersey look he put champions of course like it matches up because this is this is one of those types i mean you've looked at the kersey nfp you've looked mm -hmm. at this one is it pretty much describing the same kind of person oh, oh yeah i mean they both make great points but there <laughs> you could i would could put it together it, it, it's so similar um yeah. and i do like kersey's you know it's just so this is good too i could read them both and make them the better. irony is is that Kersey who is seen as a behaviorist in his ENFP profile, he really gets inside the character is like, like the, one of the central issues they can have between acceptance and authenticity. Yeah. Well, that I mean, that that's where that's where we can get you can lose us sometimes because as much as we we can help like it's, it's like I said on the closeness level, like I always consider it like a cookie where I'm on one side and you know the world's the other side and the cream's in the middle you know it's like you're not going to let it cross over what i don't agree with like if it's something i feel is inherently wrong like um manipulation or you know taking advantage of someone then it's it's going to yeah. stop but we want to help and we want to engage with people so right. that on authenticity does i just i literally can't do it if i don't agree with it like you couldn't get me right. to so what <laughs> i've done folks i have put a little knot there uh, other side, Ben. I put a little mark showing the way we'll start again next time. It will probably okay. be tomorrow if Alicia is free. It should be good. All right then. So, folks, this is goodbye from me and goodbye from. Bye Alicia. from Alicia. Bye oh, bye, okay. folks. Bye bye, one viewer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll be more later. <laughs> okay, here we go.